Welcome to the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee's 13th meeting of 2019. Before we move to our first item on the agenda, can I remind everyone to switch off their mobile phones or put them on silent as they may affect the broadcasting system. And the first item on the agenda is for the committee to take evidence on the Carbon Accounting Scheme Scotland Amendment Regulations 2019. And this morning I'm delighted to welcome Dr Tom Russon. Good morning, the Legislation Team Leader of the Decarbonisation Division of the Scottish Government. Good morning to you. And Andrew Mortimer, the Statistician of the Office of the Chief, Chief Economic Advisor. Good morning to you both. Um, I believe that there's a, an opening statement. Am I correct? Or I had advised that effect, but I'm very happy to speak very briefly to yeah, the, that would be good. the purpose of the SSI, if that would be helpful. Thank you to the committee. So this is one in a fairly long sequence. Uh, members of the committee will remember the previous situations, uh, I'm sure, uh, whether fondly or not, I'll, I'll leave to them to decide, um, of statutory instruments which are related to reporting on the annual targets under the Climate Change Scotland 2009 Act. So uh, all of the uh, emissions reduction targets under the 2009 Act are based on uh, emissions which have been, the term we, we use is adjusted to account for the operation of the EU emissions trading scheme or trading system in Scotland. Uh, and because that adjustment forms part of the statutory reporting requirements on the targets, the, the calculation rules by which the adjustment is performed in each year need to be set in legislation. And that happens through the Carbon Accounting Scheme Scotland uh, regulations. Now, the, the original set of regulations, which were legislated in 2010, uh, shortly after the Act itself, contained provisions to undertake the adjustment calculations for the annual target years 2010-2012, to, to 2012, I beg your pardon, uh, which corresponded to phase two of the operation of the uh, EU emissions trading system. Um, during phase three of the emissions trading system, which is all the annual target years from 2013 onwards to, to date, um, sets of amendment regulations have been required to be introduced uh, on an annual basis to introduce a new set of calculation rules for each year's uh, adjustment calculation. Um, the reason why the, those annual um, SSIs have been needed is because of the availability of data for the EMU, EU trading system itself. That data is only available year to year, so we couldn't kind of preempt it in advance and set out all the rules for future years, um, which would have probably been preferable otherwise. Um, one other point I'd, I'd just highlight, uh, I'm sure the committee is well aware of this, is that um, a lot of the dates here can be quite confusing uh, in that everything is effectively happening two years after the event. Uh, and the reason for that is simply to do with the, the timescale for the availability of emissions data itself. So, for example, the, um, the next set of emissions statistics, which will be published uh, in June of this year, or we expect to be published in June of this year, those will cover emissions during the calendar year 2017. It simply takes that long for that data to be, uh, to be available and be published. So the, uh, the accounting rules in the present uh, SSI that the committee is considering relate to uh, emissions during the calendar year 2017. And in essence, the purpose of the SSI is to allow for full statutory reporting on the 2017 annual target under the 2009 Act once those statistics become available later in the year. Okay, I hope that's helpful. It is. Um, Stuart Stevenson, you had a question. Um, yes, just to try and get a, a handle on what's going on here, can I, can I just ask if we know how many participants there are in Scotland in the ETS? Because uh, even approximately, because I saw the body language, um, because I understand that, it, that, that broadly speaking, it's certainly no more than 100, and it may be substantially less than that. Have we any sense, or, or even if you could give us a description in broad terms of who participates so that we can sort of understand yeah. a little bit more in a highly technical area about what's going on? 
very happy to do the best I can with that now. In terms of the exact number of participants, that's something we'll have to write back to the committee on. Very happy to, to do that. So, the, yeah, the, the EU ETS operation in Scotland covers both what are termed fixed installations. So, I think this is what, what your question is primarily relating to. My best understanding is that about 100 is indeed the right first order approximation, but like I say, we'll write back with the, the exact current figure. Uh, and these are large, large installations emitting significant quantities of greenhouse gases. So um, prime examples would be large industrial facilities, um, power stations, although obviously there are no longer significant uh, coal-fired power stations in Scotland, at least. Um, and if you, if you wanted to think about it in terms of, for example, the sectors in the climate change plan, what we're talking about is primarily heavy industry and parts of the power sector uh, within that breakdown. Also covered by the uh, EU emissions trading system is aviation within, within destinations within the EU. So uh, aviation operators who operate those flights uh, also report under the, the trading system. Now, that, that, that's kind of what I thought. Taking us on from there, um, what effect does it have on the operation of these uh, large industries? I mean, I'm sure my colleague uh, across the panel will be interested in relation to Grangemouth, which I'm, I'm quite confident is one of the, 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 the hundred or so. And I think also in aviation, because... Um, you know, there's a lot of aviation goes on. How does it actually affect? Does that mean there are there are cash outflows as they have to buy uh, buy uh, credits these businesses, um, and are, are are there other or businesses in Scotland which are actually net contributors and providing credits that could be bought? In other words, who are the parties to the trades that are actually going on? In again, in broad terms, I'm not looking for. Absolute data. Yeah. So, as I understand that the the thrust of this question is to do with the, the functional operation of the EU emissions trading system, which I, I should say, by way of a significant disclaimer, is not is not actually my policy area, and very happy to ask uh, colleagues to kind of yeah, provide a more detailed written explanation about about those things. Um, I might ask Andrew to come in here a second just in terms of the issue of auctioned and free allowances <coughs> installations. But perhaps if you could do that first and then I'll come back to the SSI itself. Certainly. <clears throat> um, approximately 12 times a year um, there's a, an auction run um, uh, and the data can be picked up on the Intercontinental Exchange which relates the U um, auction of UK emission allowances under the EU ETS. Um, so that, that's, that's essentially one part. There's also another part um, which is called the National Im Implementation Measures, which is essentially where um, industries at significant risk of carbon leakage to outside the EU are essentially given a free allowance as well. Um, and then there's one other part of, of it which is called the New Entrance Reserve, and that's essentially drawn upon as and when um, a new business or industry comes into, comes into being that would essentially qualify for a free, uh, a free allocation of allowances, but at the time of its setup does not have one because it has no historical reference data. My final question, um, which, which might be the most important one, is roughly, again, because I'm not expecting exactitude, um, of our total emissions, what percentage of our total emissions is covered by what this, this SSI is trying to do? Because bluntly, if it's a tiny little to the right of the decimal point, then our concerns will be comparatively modest. But if on the other hand it is 10 or 15%, they might, we might be more interested. And it would be helpful to know. So, uh, so it's, it's definitely more of that latter magnitude. Uh, again, I'll have to confirm on the exact 
percentage figure, but it's around about 25% of Scotland's total emissions are traded under the EU ETS at the present time. I mean, I, I, I would emphasise that just in terms of the immediate SSI, this, this is doing nothing as regards the underground operation of the emissions trading scheme. It's simply reflecting the operation of that when it comes to the calculation of emissions for the reporting on climate targets. Uh, thank you, convener, and uh, good morning. It's a, a short, uh, probably very straightforward um, uh, answer for you, but just to clarify, in view of the fact that we've got the new climate change bill coming, well, it is before us, it, um, as you know, the stage one report's already happened. Um, am I right in thinking that uh, there won't be any changes because um, what, what will happen in relation to this annually, unless, of course, there are amendments, but um, that, that um, this will just simply flow from the 2009 Act um, as it stands. Is that correct, or is there, are there any implications? I think I've understood the question correctly, but do please tell me if, 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 if not. So the, the need for the current SSI stems from the fact that the bill provisions are not yet agreed, much less in force. So until such a time as, uh, yeah, the bill is commenced in whatever form Parliament eventually agrees, the 2009 Act requirements remain in legal force, and that's what drives the need to do this SSI. So this SSI flows solely from the 2009 Act requirements as part of it. Uh, in terms of what the bill will mean for this going forward, if the relevant parts of the bill were to be agreed in the form which they stand, future climate targets will be set and reported against on the basis of actual emissions from all parts of the economy. Um, that will have a range of consequences, but one of them is that SSIs of this type will no longer be needed. That's what I wasn't sure about. That's helpful. Thank you. Can I just clarify, when we're talking about, we're talking about net emissions, so we're taking into account Sequestration and, and yes, this is this is a, this is an area of uh, absolutely notorious uh, complexity, and uh, even even within government, I, I assure you. Uh, so, the term net is very problematically used in slightly different ways by different parties. Um, so, the, the way in which we use it is the same way in which you're using it, convener, which is to refer to. Um, emission sources minus emission sinks. And in that regard, absolutely nothing changes through this SSI, through the bill, through anything that's being discussed at the present, at the present time. Um, in some of their, for example, in some of their previous advice, the Committee on Climate Change have sometimes used the word net in the same way that I've used the term adjusted in my opening remarks to refer to emissions net of the operation of the emissions trading scheme for example. So our preferred terminology, but obviously there's, you know, there's matters of preference here, is to refer to that as the distinction between adjusted emissions and actual emissions. So by, by actual emissions, in my, my, in my uh, previous answer, what uh, I was intending to refer to there is yeah, the, the actual levels of emissions from heavy industry and the power sector, mm -hmm. rather than kind of a pro rata share of EU-wide emissions which is what's done under the adjustment calculation. Right. Okay, thank you for clarifying that. Uh, John Scott, you had a question. Um, yes, my, well, mine was probably relatively modest and uncomplicated. I just wanted to know about the aviation activities and the, the aviation cap, and and uh, how, have those um, caps been exceeded or undershot or, or, or whatever? Um, since I haven't read the paper, um, that it is referred to at the bottom of our note, that it, it says that a paper setting out how the aviation cap and the fixed insulation cap have been determined has been published. I'm afraid I haven't seen that. So maybe could you just tell us how that has turned out, please? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'll defer to Andrew on the way in which the different components of the cap are calculated. In terms of yeah, kind of uh, your the initial part of your question, the the outturn performance kind of comparisons to the cap. I don't have those figures in front of me, but very happy to write back to the committee committee with those. All that information is available through the official statistics bulletins that get published each year. 
Okay. 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 Any other members? I think Andrew was going to answer, further answer that uh, point. Mr okay. Mortimer, you go. Okay. Apologies. Um, yeah, so the, the, the manner in which the aviation cap um, is calculated is, uh, as with all these calculations, is uh, consistent with um, EU level practice and UK level practice. So it essentially falls from that. So it's a consistent calculation. Um, and it's essentially based upon the share of S Scotland's share of EU aviation emissions between a 24 to 20, sorry, 2004 to 2006 reference period. And then in line with the EU target, which is to reduce um, aviation emissions by 95% in phase three as compared to the 2010 aviation emissions, we simply carry that into Scotland and replicate that approach. And my understanding from the aviation industry is that they're on track to sort of meet those targets. Is that correct? Uh, I don't have that information to hand. I can write back uh, if, if you wish. Stuart you, Stevenson. Please. I, I just thought it might be useful to just try and close this off and I'll give you my description of what the ETS is and see if that is, is, is reasonable. The, the, the ETS system, um, I understand to be a system whereby the allowances that heavy industry are given, which relate to what it is presumed their emissions will be, um, if they underachieve, there is a value in those allowances because they can sell them to somebody who has not got sufficient allowances to cover. So thereby creating an incentive for those who have allowances to not emit as much as their allowances permit because there's an economic value in selling to someone else, but also to create a disincentive to those who emit more than allowances because they will have to pay out money for that. Is that a fair description of what the whole thing is about? It's about trading those allowances. Again, with the caveat that it's not my immediate policy of expertise, that to me sounds like a very reasonable description of a cap and trade scheme such as the ETS. Final question from Mark Ruskell. Ask about how radiative forcing is taken into account in relation to aviation and whether the science is changing on that. So, that does fall outside the scope of the present SSI, but I'm happy to do my best at explaining how that fits into the wider legislative framework. So, Section 16 of the 2009 Act incorporates emissions from, uh, well, a fair share of the emissions from international aviation into the scope of Scotland's targets. The committee will be aware that Scotland was the first country to, to do that. We've now been joined by Wales late last year in doing so. To the best of my knowledge, I think Scotland and Wales remain the only countries to include international as well as domestic aviation emissions within their, within kind of their domestic target frameworks. And yeah, Section 16 of the 2009 Act um, required that through an entirely separate piece of secondary legislation, which I think was passed in either 2010 or 2012, again I can confirm, um, that yeah, a set of rules were set up for determining a Scottish share of international aviation activity. Um, and as part of that, as you refer to, there is this term which in the in Section 16 itself is referred to as the aviation multiplier, but then in the SSI is called radiative forcing factor. It's, to the best of my understanding, the same thing, um, which is a specific term applied to those emissions to reflect the... Um, Kind of the, the additional effects of non-CO2 emissions being emitted at altitude. Um, and there was a requirement in the 2009 Act for ministers to seek advice from the Committee on Climate Change on what the appropriate level of that term would be. The, the CCC advised on that in, I believe, well, it'll be whichever year the SSI was legislated, I believe 2011. Um, and they advised the most appropriate level based on scientific understanding at that time for the term was one, which is which is what's in statute. Now, I'm certainly not an expert in terms of where international scientific understanding about this has got to. I'm aware that, you know, specific studies have been published suggesting values other than one, 
whether there's a consensus around an alternate value, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not aware. Um, so, like I say, under Section 16 of the 2009 Act, uh, there is a, a power for ministers to bring forward a further sets of regulations which amend those rules, and they can obviously, if they were to wish, seek further advice from the CCC in terms of any aspects of that before, before doing so. But in, in essence, this SSI is about how, how it's calculated, what the, what the um, carbon units, whether they're credited or debited from the, the net emissions. That, that's, that, that's a very narrow focus yeah, so of the, this SSI. This SSI, SSI, SSI relates sorry. solely to the EU ETS adjustment calculation yeah. for 2017. Okay. Stuart, very, very quick it, it, it was just to make the observation, uh, which I hope is helpful, that the UK Climate Change Committee, when asked for advice on the radiative forcing multiplier, were at that time unable to find robust evidence that would suggest it be anything other than one. That was the advice that I received. Okay, right. Well, I, I want to thank you for your time this morning and for giving such uh, helpful evidence to us. Um, we are going to be considering the instruments part of our next agenda item. We're going to have a brief suspension just to allow you to get on with the rest of your day. Thank you very much. Thank you. item in the agenda is to consider the following negative instruments. First one being the Carbon Accounting Scheme Scotland Amendment Regulations 2019 and the Loch Carran Marine Conservation Order 2019. Do we have any comments in relation to the first instrument, the instrument we've just been discussing? No, thank you. Um, I really agreed that we don't want to make any recommendations in relation to this instrument. Agreed. Thank you. And now on to the second instrument. Are there any comments in relate, relation to the second instrument? Stuart Stevenson. Um, I just welcome the um, permanence that is now uh, given to the protection of the, uh, the, 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 the features in Loch Carran. I think the interesting thing um, in the papers that before us show the, the very, very small economic impact this will actually have with the suggestion that uh, in terms of employment, it is less than 0.1 of a person. So I think uh, this is an excellent example of uh, parliament and government working together on an important environmental issue. And, and very swift action as well, I would say. Yes, um, Angus MacDonald. Okay, um, thanks, Simona. Yeah, I'm certainly pleased to see this action being taken uh, to allow the recovery of the, the flame shell beds uh, and to maintain the Loch Carn Merrill beds uh, in a favourable condition. Uh, I have to say it's, it's ironic uh, that this action has been taken as a result of the damage uh, to the Loch Carn flame shell beds just over uh, two years ago, two years ago in a, a week, perhaps. Um, so, so this should send a strong message uh, to fishermen with mobile gear that uh, they have to be extremely careful uh, which areas they target in future and also that uh, the Scottish Government's watching. Mark Ruskell. Uh, I would agree with Mr Macdonald. It does send a strong message. However, we know that there are those who are not listening. The reason this came uh, about is because there was an illegal dredge uh, of this area. Uh, it was discovered by amateur divers so I would have questions around uh, what kind of enforcement measures the Scottish Government intends to put in place in relation to this MPA. I think writing to the Government to seek clarification on that would be, uh, would be very useful. In particular, the role of electronic vessel monitoring. Um, clearly, there are times when fishing boats may uh, pass over this MPA. There's often debate about what activities are then taking place. Are they actually legally dredging or not? And I do think electronic vessel monitoring, as agreed by this Parliament, could provide a strong role in that regard in terms of enforcement. So I think getting some clarity from the government about their wider measures of enforcement in relation to MPAs, but specifically in relation to this MPA, 
where there's been, you know, a desecration that's taken place in the past and cannot happen again. Members be in agreement that we write to the government and seek clarification on what monitoring is going to happen and what enforcement there are uh, around this MPA. Yep. Yes, thank you. Claudia? Right, uh, thank you, convener. I'm, I'm, uh, I'd like to identify with the comments of the previous members who've spoken as well um, and respect the Scottish Government for the very quick um, action at the beginning, um, which now has been built on to make this permanent. Um, uh, building on what Mark Ruskell has said, I'm, I would like, when we write to the government about enforcement, if the committee is agreeable, to ask um, whether the fines are heavy enough um, in relation to this, and what ac in, in relation to infringements, and what actually happens in terms of the cost of damage, um, because I have a concern about that as well. There, you know, how is that, um, how is that side of it dealt with? Um, also, there are um, a couple of other points I'd like to make. One is that in relation to MPAs, I was interested to see in the BRIA, um, uh, or the partial BRIA as it was called, that it says that um, the contribution of um, MPAs to an ecologically coherent MPA network means that um, each one, um, it's greater than the sum of the parts. And I, and I want to highlight that because I think it is very important in terms of how we go forward to protect our marine environment. Um, and uh, also that I do have another question, which it would be helpful if we could write, if, with the agreement of the committee, to the Scottish Government about, which is that in the 2010 uh, Marine Act, it does say not only about protecting and conserving and recovering, but also enhancing the marine environment. And I do think that's an aspect that I'd like to know to what degree um, this is being addressed, because I don't see it in the, in the instrument. Um, and finally, um, I just observe, and I don't know that we necessarily want to write about this, but for the record in the BRIA, that, and I quote, it says, it is assumed where fishing activity is impacted upon, it ceases altogether as opposed to being relocated elsewhere. In reality, some activity is likely to be displaced rather than entirely lost. And my interest in that is that it's, the BRIA is being assessed on the basis of it I th as I understand it, being entirely lost rather than displaced. And, and I think that's um, not necessarily um, a, a good way forward. However, I do respect what Stuart Stevenson was saying about um, how um, the economic impact is extremely small in this case. But as a matter of principle, I think perhaps the assessment of, of um, not entirely lost and... and um, uh, likely to be displaced could perhaps be looked at for the future. Okay, but not necessarily something we want to cover in the letter as such, or do you want that? Well, I, I would appreciate that, yeah. it if we could. It, it's, it leads forward to a point of um, looking at future cost-benefit analysis assessment yeah. rather than... I'm, I'm not concerned for this uh -huh. uh, a more general point to highlight that general point okay. along with the other points that have been made by okay. members. So are the committee in agreement that we write a letter uh, covering all the points that have been made today? Okay. Yes. And uh, we don't want to make any other recommendations in relation to this instrument? No. Right, thank you. We're going to suspend briefly.
The third item on the agenda is to take evidence on the potential impact of an EU exit on the environment. And this morning I'm delighted to welcome Professor Colin Reid, uh, who's a Professor of Environmental Law at the University of Dundee. Good morning to you, Professor Reid. Uh, I understand that you would like to make a short opening statement before we ask you some questions around this topic. Well, it was suggested it might be, be helpful just it to summarise a few points. The, the whole issue about common frameworks when we're moving away from the common frameworks of the EU into a different situation is one that has both political and technical legal aspects. And regardless of the merits, there are a number of sort of fundamental questions that have to be asked when you're thinking about common frameworks. The first question is, what sort of framework, if any, is needed to deal with a particular point? What are the advantages, disadvantages of doing things independently, separately, as opposed to doing things collaboratively? And that is, to a large extent, a political question that affects economics, business, morals, technical issues, scientific issues. You've got to decide, do we need any framework? And if so, what sort? A legal one, simply an agreement, or maybe none at all? If you're going to have a framework, you've then got to ask, who is it that's going to determine the content of the framework? Is it something that's going to be agreed by all the members of it, or is somebody going to have the final deciding decision-making power? Once you've decided that there's going to be a framework, it then may need to be implemented through legislation. And regardless of who has created the framework, some of the implementing legislation may have to be done at the different devolved levels. The EU frameworks are often put into law by the individual countries, jurisdictions, as opposed to being legislated centrally. All this process of creating the frameworks then should be subject to some sort of scrutiny, public scrutiny, parliamentary scrutiny, who's going to be making the decisions. If decisions are being made by governments in agreement, how do they, to whom are they accountable for what they do in making the agreements? You then finally have to ask about, well, what happens about compliance, enforcement and monitoring? How do we make sure that if a group of states, group of jurisdictions have agreed that there should be a common framework, how do we make sure they're sticking to it? What happens if they don't? So there's sort of these fundamental questions which have to be answered as design, the sort of fundamental design challenges in determining common frameworks quite apart from the need for them. Thank you. I'll ask you a, a question. I suppose a, a question around the kind of de devolution settlement. You said in your, your submission to us that the Brexit process has revealed weaknesses in the devolution settlement in relation to arrangements for collaboration and dispute resolution between the administrations within the UK. Can you elaborate on that further? Yeah, the, the devolution settlement was designed at a time when the UK was a member of the EU. There's always been a concern that as soon as you start devolving power, you have the risk of fragmentation. Different administrations are going off in completely different directions that cause all sorts of trouble for business, trade, the environment, all sorts of things. To some extent, in some areas, that was dealt with by having the category of reserved powers, the areas where it was thought there needed to be a simple, single UK vision, view on things. They were put in the category of reserved powers. For a lot of other things, which if you were starting from in a, in a different context, you'd be thinking, well, do we need to think about this? Do we need to have arrangements for making sure that the different countries in the UK work together? There was no need to think about that because the EU provided a common pattern, a common framework. And that was in some ways very helpful because it allowed the different nations of the UK diverge to some extent, to experiment, to go their own way, to reflect their own preferences and priorities. But you had the, I was going to say backstop, that's probably not the word to use, so you had the, the guarantee that things were not going to go too far. They were going to be operating within the same broad envelope provided by the EU. With that envelope disappearing, there's now the potential for the different countries within the UK to go off at radically different ways without any coherence, without any collaboration without any coordination. Now, politically, they obviously may not want to do that, but theoretically, they could go off in completely different directions. And there isn't really a way of preventing that, a, a forum for discussing that, because although the Joint Ministerial Council was designed and was intended to provide that, all the evidence is that it hasn't really been effective in that way. So something has to change. Rather than actually 
power resting with the devolved administrative devolved governments in certain areas like the environment yeah. um, we could be subject to a situation where that power really rests with the UK which isn't what, what devolution was designed to achieve at, at present the the way the, the devolution settlement provided for reserved and devolved powers the fallback position was always the supremacy of the UK key parliament so if there was something that hadn't been thought about if there was something where it was absolutely essential for there to be one view across the whole UK. The fallback was that the UK Parliament had its ultimate residual supremacy. OK, but that fallback's probably got the potential to be quite substantial. It now looks... Well, there's, there's, given the, the weaknesses of other ways of working, it may become the necessary. OK. Stuart Stevenson. Um, it's precisely this constitutional supremacy which you address in paragraph two of your very helpful uh, note, uh, Professor, that I wanted to just pick up on. Um, there are, of course, under the 1998 Act, uh, et al., uh, provision for cross-border activities with co-decision making. And a couple of examples which I in my experience have come was canals, for example, under the old arrangements that they've been superseded, uh, where I found myself as a minister having to provide authority uh, for the British Waterways Board to sell land in Birmingham because the rules were that all the parties, Scottish ministers and UK ministers, eh, had to agree. In other words, either side had veto. And the other one, which again actually happened is in the membership of the UK Climate Change Committee, where it requires unanimity for all appointments from all four jurisdictions as equals in the decision making process. Uh, and indeed, there was an example, and I don't want to go into the detail because it affects individuals, um, where there was a disagreement and the process worked well to resolve that disagreement, and we got someone appointed whom we could all agree on. So, I wonder to what extent that, and there will be other examples of which I'm not aware, where the UK Parliament has surrendered that supremacy. But my question is, is it your view that in legal constitutional terms, that surrender of your supremacy is a provisional one which can be undone? And therein lies the danger when you have uh, these current ministeri cross-ministerial workings, which I think I have heard no defence from any quarter suggesting have been working well. You, you've put your finger on what is a key issue, that it is ultimately the power rests with the UK Parliament and it can create these structures for joint working, decide the limits of them. It can also redefine them in future, either expanding them when things are going well or restricting them. Can I, before I go to Mark Ruskell, where does the continuity bill sit in all of this? Because a continuity bill, I guess, is designed to effectively prevent the situation that we've just described. Yes, but the, to the extent that it was trying to limit the power that Westminster uh -huh. had, it was deemed to be, it was struck down. Those are the bits, those are the bits that the Supreme Court said mm -hmm. can't work because ultimately... Parliament has the final say. Parliament could repeal the Scotland Act, right, uh, or completely re redefine it. That is the you know the ultimate constitutional fallback at present. Is is that? Yeah, Mark Ruskell. Uh, just moving to a, a different topic. Um, you mentioned in your your paper about the uh, transparency of decision making in Europe and some of the frameworks that we have already. So the co-decision making between the European Commission and the European Parliament and the involvement of stakeholders uh, within that process and the potential lack of transparency with the Joint Ministerial Committee. I was wondering if you could point to an example from the European context of where that transparency has resulted in substantially better laws. I find it hard to think of an example offhand. I think that the the whole nature of decision-making at Europe has both strengths and weaknesses. The fact that it's often a very long, slow process uh, 
is clearly a problem in terms of responding to changing situations, changing circumstances and so on. But one of the advantages of that time is that people know what's happening. There are chances, opportunities to use the various mechanisms nationally and EU level to lobby, to get ideas through for people to, to change their views. The danger is that the, the way the Joint Ministerial Committee has been working so far, it hasn't been particularly transparent. People haven't known what it's been discussing, what agrees, what decisions are going to be taken. And if we move from a situation where frameworks were decided in this slow but more open process, we may have more efficient government, but at the cost of accountability and transparency. Mm -hmm. Are there particular areas of EU policy where you feel that the involvement of stakeholders has made a, uh, made a substantial change to the outcome of that policy? I think that the, depending who you're speaking to, some people would say that the, the policy has been shaped unduly by industrial stakeholders for their interests. Other people would say that, the, for example, the, the nature organisations have had a significant say in the shaping of legislation that some people say obstructs business so mm -hmm. i think you could get different views from different people yeah yeah but ultimately it's a political decision about w which stakeholders to which stakeholders effect listen effectively to, yeah. to yeah yeah but i think the, the important point is that there should be a, an opportunity for everybody to have some input into the process mm -hmm. okay. uh, thank you Kavina, and good morning to you um I too found the paper very helpful um, on what I find very complex issues. <laughs> um, I found the um, section on air quality very interesting in relation to uh, what you say, um, uh, Professor Reid, about the minimum standards. And then, as, if I understand it correctly, that um, administrations could choose to do more, which there is... Stop me if I'm not making sense, please, but, but which, as I understand it, in relation to the EU, there is at present that arrangement. Um, and I found it particularly interesting what you highlighted, if I could just quote it, and if you could perhaps say a little more about it, um, the mutual recognition of documents certifying that emission standards are being met, rather than each jurisdiction requiring its own distinct certification. And if I understand it correctly, you then go on to say, to paraphrase, that own only differences in the outcome from a similar process rather than a wholly different process would therefore be necessary. And I found that interesting and something I hadn't thought of before. So I wonder if you could say anything more about that and how, yeah, I, how that came about. Yes, I mean, this is, this is based just on sort of starting the blank sheet rather than yes, reflecting absolutely. current no, thinking. I should, have, I should but, have prefaced it with yeah, that. Yeah. But my, the example I was thinking about, if you go to the, the scandal over the car emissions, the, the diesel testings and so on, that you may, for good reasons, different countries may want to set different standards, how many parts per million can be emitted. But from the point of view of the industry, everybody understanding it, access to the testing equipment and so on, if there's the same testing protocol with the same equipment being used, the same way of measuring things, that actually creates a degree of coherence that everybody can work with, even though different countries could then decide to set the threshold at a different level. And I think it's, that's possibly for all concerned much less disruptive. You, you can have quite big differences in the, the standard you set, but if your process for getting there, the, the, the monitoring, the equipment and so on is the same, that's possibly less disruptive than much smaller substantive differences, but actually requiring you to go through different procedures, have different documents, have different, different processes, equipment testing, on, on the way through. And it's a question of trying to work out, well, where can we, uh, even though we may have different ambitions, we may want to achieve different things, where can we, on the processes, reach agreement to make life easy for everybody so that you have comparable data across time, comparable data across geography, officials, administrations can understand what is going on, those dealing, those producers and traders know the score, know the system, they know they may have to do different things in different countries, but the system is the same. Thank you, that's helpful. And could, could I take you beyond that and ask you uh, if you have any observations about the, um, the, the possible new arrangements for um, enforcement and then taking you even further on to arrangements for 
uh, a possible prosecution and the independence of any watchdog. I wonder if you've got any comments on those, any of those issues. I think the, the whole issue of the watchdogs, we know is separate, you know, separate consultation of that, and absolutely independence, expertise, adequate yeah. resources are fundamental to that working. When we think about air quality, it's a classic example of uh, an environmental problem that's got to be looked at at lots of different layers and lots of different dimensions because you need to have the overall strategy, then you need to have more particular local measures and they can affect the design and construction of emitting equipment, they can affect their use in particular places at particular times. What's important for those, I think, is that you have clear and definite, definite rules and having national differences where there's no need for them, I think, complicates matters where there is a sort of general scientific technical consensus on certain matters about testing and so on. That allows you then to concentrate on what each nation actually wants where, you, where you're setting the standards and to focus, focus on that. But in view of, the, I, I appreciate what you're saying about um, separate consultation on courts and those issues, but um, is it possible for you to help us with our thinking at all by making any comment? I don't want to put you on the spot. But well, no, I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm going back to the office to start writing my possibly quite lengthy right. response to the con consultation. But yeah, I think there is a, the criteria of expertise, independence, resources are the, the, the crucial one. There are, there can be merits in linking the enforcement and monitoring to existing frameworks within Scotland. There can be there are also merits of having a completely separate body, as a, which is a line that's being followed in, in England. Wales has got the interest because it's starting in a very different position. It's got a quite different foundation that it may or may not choose to build on. I'm speaking at a conference on Thursday in the, the UK Environmental Law Association is holding, and one of the key issues there is going to be to discuss which of these options do people think is the best? Okay. Did you want to ask uh, Mark Russell's short question. Yeah, just, just on, on the back of that, I mean, the, the air quality issue has obviously been, you know, foremost in the public's minds and the role of the European Court of Justice has been important in terms of driving government action. How would you see the, the proposed um, Office of Environmental Protection that's proposed by Westminster as providing a, a, a similar role? I mean, is it, do you think that could be effective in terms of really challenging uh, where, where government plans are seen as, as, as failing to, to meet the air quality targets that are required of it or not? I don't. The, the great advantage of the current position is that the European Commission sits outside the national frameworks yeah. but has some real levers, some real power in terms of calling government to account. When you get rid of that level outside the, the one country, clearly you're weakening the, the potential. So it becomes a question of how effective, how vigorous, how respected any watchdog becomes. Is it going to be tied into parliamentary procedures which are then going to be truly effective in calling government to account? Is it going to have the, the regard from the public, from other stakeholders, so that its views are taken seriously, or is government simply going to be able to brush it, mm -hmm. brush it aside? Mm -hmm. And that's largely a, a, a culture issue going, going forward. It's very hard to say now in designing something whether it's going to be a success or not, because you have lots of examples over the years of different bodies being set up, and some are respected, their views are followed, Others aren't over time attitudes change. The Royal Commission on Environmental Pollution, for example, was a, at one stage a very highly respected, strong body, but then after a time it was simply abolished. Mm. Mm -hmm. um, it strikes me that, you know, 29th of March has been and gone, and we're talking about concepts still rather than actual plans. I mean, there's a huge... Um, big question mark for people who have to operate in the spheres of, you know, manufacturers of particular plastics, for example, known for their... How, how far do you get a sense that things are, are coming together? 
I, well, the, on the wider issue of governance and enforcement and so on, I think there was some surprise that the current consultation is still so open-ended, given how close we are to the to Brexit today, or possibly even past, and the absence of anything to do with interim arrangements to do with that. In terms of the common frameworks, there's been this vast slew of legislation going through, which I don't think, don't know if anybody's been able to follow and see what's happening. I think that the, there is an assumption that certainly for the time being, the status quo will follow. You know, we'll just, nobody's rushing to change things immediately, partly because of the uncertainty of the withdrawal agreement, whether we're going to be tied into the status quo for a certain period. But I know that the civil servants at UK, Scottish, other levels have been working incredibly hard trying to get through a power of work to do this, but they themselves will admit there are going to be gaps, there are going to be things they've got, they've got wrong. Uh, it is an unprecedented situation to try to change things and to try to do it in the face of such political uncertainty as in not knowing what the arrangement, when the date is going to be and what the position immediately after that is going to be. I just find it you know, absolutely astonishing that uh, I got to the stage where my, my slides to accompany my lectures weren't, didn't just have a particular date on them, but were saying, as of lunchtime, on <laughs> such and such a date, this is, this is the position. Yeah. John Scott. Was, was, was that an early lunch or a late lunch? <laughs> um, can I just take you back to common frameworks? Uh, 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 how they might be established. Uh, I mean, your paper is, uh, offers so, so many uh, variables, if you like, in terms of, of, of the solutions. And um, one of the uh, points that you make is that the, the European Union Withdrawal Act 2018 is essentially the real starting point. Um, and so can you tell us where, in your view, which of the many options you propose uh, as being possible options, in your view, uh, how, how we should proceed from here? It, it's like a SWOT analysis. You're long in analysis and you're long on options, but if you could give us some indication on what you would actually say, we as a parliament should be pursuing. Uh, that may be a different thing from what the government should be pursuing, but. Um, especially on both ideas, if you would like to. I think the ideal is to have truly agreed common frameworks, joint working between the, the governments where things do not move forward without the agreement of all four ad administrations. And that, in turn, then leaves the question about, well, how does the, the parliament keep an eye on what the governments, the parliaments keep an eye on what the governments are doing and that requires either the parliament somehow to come together to provide some scrutiny of what's happening at the the UK the, the joint UK level or each parliament to have its own mechanisms for making sure that before the government agrees to something there's been some input and afterwards it can call it to account but I think that heading for properly joint probably agreed common frameworks is the answer. It may be that in practical terms, uh, dividing up responsibility for particular areas between the different administrations might make sense. You know, some fishing matters might be led by, by Scotland, other matters led by the other administrations, but what comes together, the way forward should be agreed by all the administrations. And I suppose that is the real sticking point because if if three out of the four administrations can agree, but the four are not, um, then how should that matter ultimately be resolved? Well, that's where the talking about a new structure requires something about dispute mm -hmm. resolution, where there is a, a process for negotiation, arbitration, whatever. There is then ultimately a difficult political question, which is complicated in the UK context by the very disparate sizes of the different different nations in many areas where you've got a number of units coming together. 
you don't have such a great disparity in size because at present England, you know, in terms of population, economy and so on, is just so much bigger than all the others that the de facto power may, may sit there. It's very hard to see the, you know, the, the political arguments, the balance... It's not going to be a contest between equals. Quite. And quite apart from the political arguments, I mean, there's also the functions of geography and latitude in different environments in which each of the four uh, countries operate in. And once again, you come back to this huge number of variables. Um, and that's um, also added into the mix of the difficulty in deciding the best way to proceed, uh, and, and not unreasonably. Um, so... I'm afraid, it, I'm afraid it just is a complicated, <laughs> a complex issue. That's why the, in the longer term, getting a proper settlement of how the different administrations are going to, going to work, some sort of framework, seems the best way forward. Re revising, revitalising the Joint Ministerial Committee Council and getting that to work with greater transparency, with clearer means of dispute resolution, which have the, the trust of the different administrations rather than the, the Cabinet Office playing such a key, w key w role in it. Would you be optimistic that um, if, if the, the difficulties of, of getting um, Brexit organised that have been manifest at Westminster were ultimately, or to be resolved in the short to medium term, that there would be sufficient goodwill all round to make the Joint Ministerial Committee work better and more efficiently, given the energy that is being expended elsewhere currently? There is potential, but I wouldn't be too optimistic, I think, because there's been, because of some of the conflicts there have been, and because everybody's just been so busy, there's still this rush to get things done and to resettle things there will be in for the next two three five seven years the rush to get the relationship with the eu and with other trade partners up and running there's going to be still so much going going on and there's been so much backlog of other work that's been had to be abandoned while brexit's dominated everything that the appetite for reflecting on a difficult issue such as the arrangements in intra-UK government, just the appetite for that I, I fear isn't going to be there. Can I just ask, you're talking about the, the JMC being revitalised and um, all, all countries of the UK having you know, equal status in terms of, of, of decisions being made around common frameworks. Would you also apply that to decisions being made around trade agreements? I'd have thought that one of the the, the areas of real contention is the fact that the international affairs, including trade agreements, are currently completely in the hands of the, the UK government, in the same way as it was only the UK that technically the EU dealt with mm -hmm. for international trade. It's yeah. the same. And all the arguments that there have been, that there were about the role of the devolved administrations in the UK's negotiation position with the EU are going to recur and, in fact, become ever more serious because the decision, whereas the EU decision-making process, there were opportunities for the devolved administrations to feed in one way or another directly through the UK and elsewhere when it comes to the international agreements, there's less obvious how the Scottish, Welsh, Northern Ireland voice is going to be hard when the UK is discussing with China, the USA and so on. Yeah, because a lot of the standards that we applied might be dependent on what kind of trade agreements are made with countries. Trade, agree trade agreements well. can't cut across the power of the individual administrations to do yeah. things. And that the agricultural bill that's going through Westminster just now is very explicit about giving the UK ministers the power to make regulations to deal with World Trade Organization's issues, which mm -hmm. cuts across devolved responsibilities. Yeah. John, do you want to ask any more questions? No. no. Stuart. Um, We've been talking about Joint Ministerial Committee. Now, in asking what I'm about to ask, I have a simpler solution, of course, which I've been campaigning for all my life. But why don't we have joint parliamentary committees if there are joint ministerial committees? Because I think uh, all the administrations would feel matters of this kind of joint working should not simply be a matter for governments. I think that's a, an excellent idea that has been 
mentioned various times that, that if you're going to have joint workings between administrations, why not have joint commissions or whatever between the various parliaments to exercise scrutiny of them? It's I mean, it's, it's, it's worth saying I'm aware at least of one instance, and I'm pretty sure it's not the only one, of joint meetings between parliaments. Um, one of the committees I was on once had a joint meeting with an Australian uh, parliament uh, committee. Um, it was interesting that the two official reports coordinated so that it produced nearly the same result in the two, uh, two parliaments. But the other thing, uh, broadly, which touches on the same subject, um, where you've talked about watchdogs. Um, one of the things that does seem to stand above Parliament is the courts, and the courts can hold the Parliament and the government to account. Should, therefore, we not simply be talking about watchdogs, but the court system that will have the ability to hold governments to account as well, whether at UK or Scottish, Welsh or whatever uh, level, because we're not hearing very much about that. The courts certainly have a major role to play in terms of the common frameworks. Obviously, their job is to enforce, make sure the law is being applied. So that means that they can only do as mm -hmm. far as the law, the law says. And the tradition, the convention in the UK, Scotland, has been that the law tends to be empowering rather than setting out particular outcomes, certain things to be, uh, be achieved. So it would be a fairly, something of a change to have the courts involved in more nitty-gritty detailed issues. And this is particularly an issue in the environmental area, something that's going to be significant as, we, as the EU law becomes domestic law, that the EU law much more requires particular outcomes to be achieved. It, you have to achieve a certain level of water quality. You have to achieve, you have to protect your European nature sites unless there are certain very narrow derogations. And it's not altogether clear how those fit into our judicial system. If you take, for example, bathing water, you know, the bathing water is meant to meet certain standards. If it doesn't, well, who has the power to go to court to ask for that? When do you do it? If you're talking about standard on something like uh, you know, recycling standards and so on, do you wait until the, the due date and you actually have failed to meet it? Or can you take action before it when it looks as if you're on the way to meeting it? Fairly. And then if you take things like the bathing water standards, well, the failure to meet the bathing water standard will be the result of a combination of several factors. What remedy can the court actually produce? It can tell the government, you've got it wrong. You haven't, you've not been doing it right. But should they actually be saying, how, what, what further steps have to be taken? How do you do the follow-up? If you're looking at other areas where air pollution, for example, there are so many different factors feeding into that. Do you simply legislate for the final quality or do you try to legislate in more detail below that so that you can then have more enforcement but that then deprives you of your flexibility it means everything's getting very fixed up rigid and so on and can be then become very legalistic so i'm sorry that i can't come with easy answers but there, oh, there, no. there, there aren't any any exactly mark ruskell there is a concern that a lot of the statutory instruments that we've been working through um, that effectively you know, set up the rules for, for a no-deal Brexit um, could become you know, the permanent basis for retained law beyond the transition period uh, going forward. What, what's your, your view on that threat? Or opportunity, I guess, for some people may see it as an opportunity. But. I think yeah, the, it's almost inevitable that what's been done in a hurry to keep things going is going to continue for a long time. There's just so much going on that nobody's going to be able to revisit it. The current, a lot of the statutory instruments, what they do quite inevitably is get rid of the additional EU layer, the oversight layer, the need to check things, the need to report things. And that is, I think, one of the big losses with 
coming out of the EU that there isn't this reporting monitoring outside the UK authorities, which is going to be done, which is why the idea of some sort of internal governance watchdog to fulfil that role separate from government, I think, is important. In terms of the next few years, as I said, I think that the sorting out the arrangements for our relations with the EU and beyond is going to be the dominant factor that people aren't going to be able to think, do we want to do this differently, better, because they won't know how much freedom of action they're going to have if we're going to remain in alignment with the EU, then that's, that's what has to happen. If we are going to be influenced by potential trade agreements, then what's necessary for those will dominate it. I think that the chance for genuine, original, creative reflection on where are we, what do we think is the best for us and our needs, whether that's Justice Scotland or the UK, I think are going to be limited for the next while, if only because everybody's exhausted. I, w I want to um, ask you about your response. That the, the Scottish Government have made a commitment not to create divergent policy you know, as a result of these frameworks. Um, but how do, do you think that that might restrict parliaments potentially? I mean, is that, that, that seems a, a statement that's almost kind of tying them to something. Yeah, it is. A, it, it, it's, it's a trade-off that you either have, you've got freedom to do, to do your own thing or you get the benefits of working with, with other people. And within the EU structure, in some areas, they required absolute uniformity on rules. Others, they set broader objectives that each nation, each jurisdiction could reach its own way towards, towards doing that. So what do you mean by the... You know, align, alignment with what? Is it the detailed alignment with all the particular rules or is it just with the, the broad standard, the broad, the broad objective? Yeah, I guess that's a question for our Cabinet Secretaries when yeah. they come in afterwards. But, uh, but John Scott. Standing, I'll ask it of you anyway. And so what are the attendant risks of that obligation to, as it were, the aspirations of, of Scotland and the Scottish Government that commitment that there may be what might be the costs there may be things where scotland would want to go further on particular issues where it gets held back by the other other members in the it's a, it's a uk example rather than a, a scottish one but it was you know the co it was often said that in the eu animal welfare was something where the UK would want to would have wanted to go further, but was being held back by the other members at the other time on some other areas. If you go back 20 years on things like water quality, the Britain was being pushed into higher, more rigid standards compared to the rest of Europe, and it's I a, remember. a, a trade-off and all and all these things. So it'd be a question of identifying which areas does. Scotland, the UK want to do something different, want to have higher, better, more demanding standards. And are we, are we being held back by the desire to keep in step with others? Because they've also made, the Scottish Government have also made a commitment to, to keep their standards in line with EU standards yeah. development going forward. Yeah. Has that commitment also been made by the UK Government? I mean, that's, not that's in as many, not in as many words. It's still, it has a commitment to looking after the environment, but the 25-year plan that was produced isn't phrased in terms of keeping in line with the EU. And of course, that's also assuming keeping in line with the EU is actually the best thing for the environment. We're always, you know, there could be, it would have been, even before the EU referendum was held, I was at a conference where there was a fascinating discussion that actually you could put forward a completely different argument for leaving the EU, which is that the EU hasn't done enough mm. to protect the environment, that it's the, you know, the global capitalist, mm -hmm. etc., industrialist dominated, it's, it's the baddie and that we should be, you know, and that being in the EU was actually stopping countries mm -hmm. going off on completely radical new sustainable opportunities, whereas the way the debate happened before the referendum here, it looked as if deregulation from London was going to be the dominant theme and that staying in the EU was the way of providing some protection for the environment. It's been fascinating the way that debate, those perceptions have changed.
And I guess yes. that's a question yeah. for and the that's then a, And that's then a question the about UK how... government. Yeah. Who knows what the view is going to be the next minister, the next government, five, ten, twenty years from now? Yeah. I, I, I'm sorry to come back to that question again, but in environmental terms or in a broader sense, what do you see as the attendant risks to Scottish aspirations, if any, of that commitment made um, not to diverge from, or radically diverge from the the the, the in the UK position? Yeah. I think the, the risk is that you lose the flexibility to do things dramatic. If we were Scotland was the, if the, the zero waste economy idea was to be taken really seriously, that may mean imposing restrictions, imposing limits on the use, the sale of certain goods, products and so on, which might not be possible if you're trying to keep in line with a, a wider wider framework. And I guess we are about to receive the government, the Scottish Government and ourselves are about to receive the, the, the advice from the Committee on Climate Change. We're eagerly anticipating what they're about to say in terms of targets and potential pathways to achieving um, reductions in, in emissions. The Scottish Government have said that they will take their advice and they, they will implement that. The UK government haven't so far. So I guess um, my question is, how would meeting our ambitions around, for example, something like climate change be affected if we can't have divergent positions on how to achieve that? I mean, we're not, we're not going to meet our targets if, if we can't diverge, if there's not a commitment across the whole of the UK. Yeah, and that's and that uh, I mean the energy, the climate change is an issue which the the whole well, not only does the air obviously move, but even matters like the energy industry, because some of that is reserved. You don't have this potential if you're going to have uh, if you believe that an emissions trading system is going to be an effective role. Well, clearly, the bigger the pool you're trading in, the easier it is that you have to trade off the, the costs, what, you know, if we are, if we are going to, there, there are several very radical things you could do that would allow, you know, that would make impacts on our greenhouse gas emissions, but that would be very disruptive for, for trade, very disruptive for, for the economy. Do we want to do that? Yeah. Claudia Beamish. Thank you, convener. It's a follow-up point on this part of the discussion, and you highlighted in your paper the um, deposit return scheme that we're uh, we're uh, working to adopt in Scotland. And uh, and I think I'm right in saying that you described that there was scope for commonality. Now, is that different to each administration, say Scotland and England, having exactly the same? Is there scope also for having slight different schemes as long as... I think there are scope for differences. The question yeah. of trying to think where, where are there differences that matter and where can we do things the, 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 the same when it counts. That if you have... If every nation developed its completely separate system mm. that dealt with different sets of products in a different way with different labels and so on. That is very disruptive for industry, for people going, it's very, it's unlike, like with people moving around the country, people are going to get confused and jealous is, is you're going to have poor compliance with it. It may be that if you have certain things the same, even though the schemes may be a bit different in terms of what the scale of the reward is, exactly what products can be put into it, but if they're using the same classification system, the same labelling system and so on, it's a lot easier for people mm -hmm. to know what's going on, even though there are differences at the end. And I think that one of the, the lessons of the EU was that a lot of the regulation on environmental matters was driven not by environmentalists, but by industries who are wanting to have the level playing field common standards to know what they were, had to do in all the different countries, rather than having to cope with, you know, the all, each, each country completely, completely separately. And even I think that there is, 
there are advantages to be had in trying to have the, the processes and the systems similar, mm -hmm. even though you may want to have different ambitions for the end result. Thank you. Um, Mark Ruskell, did you, just, did you want to ask another question or no? It, it's, it's kind of related, but slightly, slightly different. And it, and it was about the environmental principles and about how they're being applied um, in different jurisdictions, uh, or at least planned to be applied in different jurisdictions across the UK, and whether that could lead to some divergence. I mean, I'm aware that, you know, that, that there are different, different terms about whether, you know, laws should be based on environmental principles or whether they should just have due regard and it you know what is that could that lead to divergence or or not i think it it could lead to some divergence it depends how different the phrasing is in the different countries and how different the list of principles are i think that one thing that would help was be if all the the countries agreed to ha or had adopted an uh, a duty to have regard or to at least to, to work towards a high level of environmental protection if there was a, a sh an objective in each country that set a high level of environmental protection as a goal to be worked towards. I think that helps to bring together any lesser differences between the, the duties. But yes, it would be quite possible that if you had one, some countries would just had to have regard to a particular, say the polluter pays principle and another country they had to you know, the, the duty was to act in accordance with the polluter pays principle. Mm -hmm. You could see that a, a common framework on producer responsibility for waste and so on being legally challenged in one country on the basis that, well, it doesn't actually achieve, do enough to achieve polluter pays, whereas in other countries, if the duty was just to have regard, well, the fact that the court had thought about, that the government had thought about it as part of their planning, as part of the policy making, would be enough to satisfy the legal requirement in another jurisdiction, they could be getting into trouble if they couldn't show mm -hmm. that they hadn't just thought about it, but had done something that was working towards implementing it. Mm -hmm. We're rapidly running out of time, but I want to give you the opportunity, uh, I guess, to, to if there's anything you think that we should also be considering as we question our cabinet secretaries, but we also question um, the UK cabinet secretaries who have, you know, the. They're, they're going to be the ones that are going to be involved in the, the, the uh, creation of these common flame frameworks. I think that it is the issue of how the frameworks are created and implemented, that the latest document, the April 2019 document of frameworks, talks an awful lot about informal agreements, memoranda of understanding and so on, which are in some ways are fine because they're flexible, easy to work out, but it does raise issues about transparency and and accountability, that you need to make sure that the mechanisms that are being used do enable people to find out what's going on, to have input into them, and for governments to be held properly to account. Okay, well, thank you very much for your time this morning. Okay. That's been very helpful. Thank you. We'll suspend briefly.
Considering our consider, uh, continuing our consideration of the potential impact of an EU exit on the environment, I'm delighted to welcome our panel who's just joined us. Um, Rosanna Cunningham, the Cabinet Secretary for Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform, and Michael Russell, the Cabinet Secretary for Government Business and Constitutional Relations, and the Cabinet Secretary are accompanied this morning by Katrina Carmichael, the Deputy Director of Environment and Land Use Strategy. Good morning. Uh, Don McGilvery, Deputy Director of Environment Quality, Environmental Quality and Circular Economy, and uh, Jill Glass, the Head of the UK uh, Frameworks Unit of the Scottish Government. Good morning to you all. Um, we've just had a very interesting discussion um, with Professor Colin Reid, um, largely focusing on common frameworks and um, I guess the evolution and the effectiveness of, of uh, devolved governments and being able to sort of set their own policy in the, in the light of proposed common frameworks. Um, I'd like to ask both the cabinet secretaries if you have a view on whether the devolution settlement is secure. <laughs> in, in the light of uh, common frameworks um, and the potential, I guess, for taking power away from the devolved uh, governments. Um, I guess, M Michael Russell, if you want to go first. Uh, uh, well, Camino, that is the that was, a, was and is at the heart of the negotiations that we've been engaged in through the Joint Ministerial Committee process. Um, the Scottish Government's view has been very clear that we are not going to uh, be part of a process that undermines the devolution settlement or takes powers away from the devolved administrations. Uh, equally, we have argued that the Brexit process essentially is too heavy for the devolution settlement to bear. And whilst it's very clear what I want and, and the Scottish Government wants in terms of independence, on that journey, uh, it, you know, we are more than willing to work with those who want to make some changes for the benefit of the people of all these islands because the current constitutional settlement no longer works. We can see a, a dramatic uh, uh, example of that in the um, uh, uh, legislative consent uh, uh, process, but there are many other uh, illustrations. I gave a, a lecture to the Institute for Government about a month ago, which lays out in some more detail how we think things should change. But broadly, the uh, relationship should be put on a statutory footing. Uh, there should be a legislative underpinning in the way in which we relate one to another. And the example for that actually lies in the EU 27. Uh, if you've seen their solidarity and their work and their trust for each other, it, trust in the EU is because it is underpinned by a, the ability to enforce regulations. It's a law-based, a rules-based uh, structure. Uh, and indeed, the Taoiseach uh, said that very memorably at a British Irish Council I was at, that trust is not simply about saying, you know, we like you, we think you're good, and we want to get on with you. Trust is about saying we're going to work together, and here is a framework that can enforce that. Now, there's no such thing in devolution, regrettably, and there needs to be. The difficulty with that is that devolution is built on a, a construct of, of a, parliaments dancing round, our parliament, the Welsh parliament, the Northern Ireland Assembly, dancing round this concept of the sovereignty of the Westminster parliament. An outmoded concept, uh, one might argue almost a medieval concept. But it's important to recognise in devolution that that is the problem. If you have a sovereign parliament which can overrule the other parliaments, then it is very difficult, in fact impossible, to work on the basis of equality, which is what we should be doing. It's also important to recognise, however, there is no hierarchy of governments in devolution. There is only a hierarchy of parliaments. So governments have particular powers uh, given to them which they can operate, and those parliaments can operate them. It is only the UK government can only overrule the Scottish government by going to the UK parliament and using the UK parliament so to do. Now, I'm happy to go into, you know, perhaps after, after the, the cabinet secretary has contributed, I'm happy to go into how this relates to frameworks and how it relates to the agreement on the frameworks, which I know has been uh, an issue of concern to you, because it is in that context uh, that we work. And we've worked on the assumption that we will not accept the undermining of the devolution settlement, but we will accept working together, provided that is voluntary. I guess that asking Rosanna Cunningham from a portfolio perspective, um, if there is a divergence in policy around your portfolio, how the common frameworks might might work. 
Well, at the moment, we need to remember there are no frameworks in place. Uh -huh. So these are simply um, proposed uh, um, frameworks. Uh, there are four legislative frameworks being proposed for this portfolio interest. That's chemicals, um, waste, and it's about producer responsibility and waste management, um, ozone depleting substances and fluorinated greenhouse gases, and the EU emissions trading system. There are five proposed non-legislative frameworks uh, in the ECCLR portfolio, um, which the committee may, I presume you're aware of those as well. Um, so all of these discussions are still discussions that are being had almost at an official level, at level of officials. They're not as yet uh, coming to ministers for sign-off, although we continue to raise the issues around them at the DEFRA devolved administration meetings. Um, and as it happens, I was at the DEFRA DA meeting yesterday in Cardiff um, when some of the issues around the proposed common frameworks were being discussed, not at the level of the individual proposed frameworks, but still at the level of how we manage this, this process um, and the, uh, the tricky questions that uh, Mike has uh, referred to are part and parcel of, at the moment, why we're not going to be giving any carte blanche to anything that looks like it will erode um, the, uh, the, the policy uh, responsibility that uh, we have in Scotland, and indeed Wales is pretty much in the same place as we are on, on these. But it is a tricky issue, um, and uh, I, I think it would be, uh, I personally would find it uh, helpful if, uh, frankly, some of the voices out in the wider uh, uh, network of people involved in all of this um, would stand up for the devolved settlement and our devolved policy responsibility, um, perhaps uh, do so publicly and certainly do so uh, in a stronger way because there is a danger, as Mike, as Mike has alluded to, that the presumption of the parliamentary sovereignty at Westminster will simply start to override um, anything that we do. And of course, environment um, uh, is effectively an area in which policy is virtually all devolved. Um, and it is an issue that we have to keep reminding them of at these uh, devolved administration meetings. I guess that leads on to talking about stakeholders and their participation in this process and what leverage they can leverage, influence. I wonder if I just might make a point. I, I know the concern about this lies partly in the wording of the reports, the quarterly reports that the UK government uh, issues on frameworks, uh, and in particular the, the fact that um, the paragraph that says, uh, on the basis of continuing joint progress and collaboration on joint frameworks, which ensures the statute book is ready for exit day, the UK government has again concluded it does not need to bring forward any Section 12 regulations at this juncture. This is the, the one in December. In addition, the Scottish and Welsh governments have reconfirmed their commitment not to create divergent policy in ways that would cut across future frameworks where it has been agreed that they are necessary or where discussions continue. And that's the important thing. This is a voluntary action. Where we sit down and agree that a framework, and these frameworks do not exist, will not exist unless there was an exit and, you know, and at the end of an implementation period, and they would be entered into voluntarily. So if you enter into the framework voluntarily, you're working on a framework, clearly you will have agreed at that stage that you will try and coordinate policy. But if you don't enter into a framework, or if you say this framework allows for divergent policy, which is perfectly possible, then in those circumstances, there is no question about it. There's nothing in that that limits the power of any of the contributing bodies. And in fact, having divergent policy and frameworks may become a very real issue uh, if you look at the situation in Northern Ireland. If Northern Ireland is, is in, you know, essentially in full regulatory alignment with the, the, the rest of Ireland, if that is uh, you know, full regulatory align alignment with the EU, then you might have a situation with Northern Ireland in a framework where it is doing something that the rest of the framework isn't. It's, it's immensely complicated and part of the, forgive me for saying this, part of the extraordinary idiocy of Brexit. But you know, this is, in no sense have we agreed, nor would we agree, uh, 
to have things imposed upon us, and we have made it explicit that if it's Section 12 is used to try and impose things upon us, we withdraw from that discussion at that moment. Yes, part of the discussion yesterday in Cardiff was precisely around, um, and we do have to continue to have this discussion, that even a common framework does not mean that every partner in that framework is going to be doing exactly the same thing. It means there is a discussion and an agreement about how things might be worked through, but it doesn't require everybody uh, uh, to be doing the same thing. Uh, um, and that's and that's uh, and, and that, but that's a continuing conversation that needs to be mm -hmm. continually brought to the forefront of the discussion because there is a, a a kind of sliding into what you might regard as a kind of normal Westminster think space. Mm -hmm. It strikes me that if any of the devolved governments <clears throat> have a disagreement with what the UK decide to do, that that's not really going to be taken into account. I mean, you, you mentioned, the, I suppose, one of the things that the EU is good at is that all member states have a, have to agree on on things, and there's a mechanism there. But there's, there's no, no mechanism in the there JMC. Yeah. There's no mechanism yeah. no, in the JMC for that. This is no report into the JMC structure from the very beginning of devolution, and we've had this, of course, since the beginning of devolution, has come to any other conclusion but the fact that it doesn't work and isn't fit for purpose, including House of Commons reports, House of Lords reports, uh, academic studies. The JMC structure doesn't work. Uh, we tried to, we've been trying to make it work again with the new JMC EN, but it hasn't worked. And it will not work. Uh, none of these structures will work until there is, and even if there is an equity, I think there's a better way of doing it, but there has to be an equitable relationship between the members. And you can't have that if you have a sovereign parliament. By definition, you can't have that. And you also can't have it if the UK government believes it can overrule and there is, in some way, it is at the top of a hierarchy of governments. You've also got a situation, and, and I think Westminster MPs, I've, I've heard this discussed by Westminster committees, you've also got a situation in which, regrettably, the knowledge of devolution is very poor uh, in the UK government and in the civil service. Now, it's not a direct criticism. It's actually always been the case since devolution that hasn't really been thought about. David Cameron talked about devolving and forgetting, and that's what's happened. So trying to bring home to UK ministers the reality of devolution is also quite a hard job. That's why I look so old. <laughs> I couldn't possibly comment. Um, Mark Ruskell. Um, Rosanna, I heard you talk about the need to uh, get more support, presumably from stakeholders, uh, to protect Scotland's powers and responsibilities under the devolution settlement. And I'm just wondering if that's easier to do if you've got a clear vision for how you're going to use those powers, i.e. through an environment strategy or an agriculture strategy. Um, I mean, obviously, there, there is a continuing uh, conversation uh, around the environment strategy, which we've been uh, uh, working on. Um, uh, I wasn't really thinking about it in those terms. I was thinking about one of the difficulties being, and I don't, I don't lay this at the door of the Scottish-based NGOs, particularly. Um, the, the difficulty is that, if you like, that metropolitan mindset permeates even the London-based ENGOs, who I suspect aren't particularly conscious of or understanding of the, the, the extent of devolution. So um, uh, when the convener talks about there, you know, there's still, sorry, no, was it Mike, you talked about the, the difficulties in some parts of the civil service who've not mm. quite really absorbed these things. It's not just the civil service that are in, the, in that space. Um, uh, and, and therefore, I think there is some work to be done um, uh, to ensure that understanding of what, you know, in, in an office in London might look like a, a kind of simplistic solution to an issue, but is, is, an, is, a, is a solution that's been arrived at by forgetting that this is an area of policy that is almost wholly devolved. Mm -hmm. and, and, Do you, you know, have an example? I, I mean, well, um, deposit return or I don't know. Other, sorry? Uh, do you have an example? I mean, are you thinking deposit return or, or other? Well, it, no, I wasn't actually thinking about deposit return, and I don't want to be drawn on individual things. I mean, I mean, one of the, the we, I mean, one of the debates that we're having, and I'm sure the committee will come on to it, is the is the issue about the the, the, the governance, uh, uh, the, the kind of governance that might be brought into play uh, um, once we're 
put into a post-Brexit scenario. Um, and the automatic presumption at, at some levels is that that governance should just be a UK governance. But not thinking through the implications for situations where there are very different uh, 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 policy decisions being made in different parts of the of the UK, just in a sense, just rushing to and in a context where some of the issues that Mike is talking about are important, because normally when we think about that, that, that it won't be seen as, for example, a four nation uh, yeah. uh, group where you know each has equal standing, it will be regarded as, a, as one where one government has, has a, that's that hierarchical issue that locks in. Now, you know, these are issues which concern us and have to concern us because they can impact on, on the policy making uh, uh, ability of this parliament, but not just the policy making ability of this parliament, the accountability mm -hmm. of this parliament. What you don't want is me uh, and other ministers sitting here and saying, well, do you know what, actually, there's not much point asking us about this because that was, that was a decision taken uh, elsewhere. So there's issues of accountability as well. Um, and, and that's, I think, one of the things that's being lost in some of the discussions that are being had. And it isn't just civil servants who are not understanding that underneath the surface, there are there are wider groups out there as well, and I, you know, and it is we we have had conversations uh, uh, to try and remind folk, but it's easy to forget, uh, I think, if you're just thinking in a very straightforward metropolitan mindset. I'll give Mr. Ruskell a very direct example of of of, of a difficulty that exists. It's not in the sector, but it's illustrative because it's actually current today. Uh, the visa requirement uh, for students has been set by the UK at three years. Scotland has four-year degrees. I raised this with David Liddington very early on in the, the once. An announcement was made without consulting us, but I raised it immediately with David Liddington. I think the First Minister raised it at uh, uh, JMC Plenary. Uh, we were absolutely sure that this would be taken account of. What did we hear yesterday? That students will have to apply for a different type of visa for their last year. Can you imagine being a student trying to go through the process of higher education and also focused on whether... <clears throat> whether or not you would get a visa for your fourth year, because it's not the simplest thing in the world. Now, that is an example of how something could be dealt with very quickly and se sensibly, but it hasn't been dealt with quickly and sensibly. It's got bogged down in the Westminster system of saying, well, if Scotland's an exception, they'll just have to live with it. I mean, we had papers uh, you know, released during the process of preparation for um, the government white paper on Brexit, which had forgotten that Scotland had a legal, separate legal system. Right. I mean, you know, forgotten. It's only you know, been enshrined in law since 1707 by the Act of Union, but they've forgotten. That, I mean, I'm not, that's not an individual mm. criticism. It is mm. a systems failure. And it's a systems failure that a lot of work has gone in to try and rectify. But actually, you, know, it, you do eventually get to Occam's razor, the simplest solution is the best. Uh, and that is to have a relation of equity based on two sovereign states breath as I asked this before I hand over to my colleague John Scott because I think I know what the answer might be but the, the, what's the relationship between the Scottish government and the UK relation, um, UK government when it comes to looking at future trade deals <laughs> and I mean obviously some of these trade deals have already been done and they have implications for this portfolio um, and if UK's government's negotiation position takes precedent what, what are going to be the potential implications for common frameworks? It's not just common frameworks. Um, yeah. We published a, a paper last August on a, a modern trade uh, relationship and the way in which trade deals should be negotiated in future. But taking into account that the, the UK is very old-fashioned, how it does trade, of course it hasn't negotiated a trade deal itself you know, for, for, for a very long time because it's been part of the EU. Um, in trying to do, the world has changed. Environmental considerations, for example, are at the heart of many trading relationships and should be. So should human rights considerations be at the heart of it. Uh, we suggested a, a way of moving forward that would involve the devolved administrations, particularly in areas that devolve competence, but not solely in areas that devolve competence, because there are other issues that, that attach. Regrettably, the UK seems to have taken to heart the wrong lesson from the CETA treaty. There, there, there are two lessons you can draw from the CETA treaty. The one of which is 
if you involve everybody you know, who is likely to be affected, as the Canadian provinces were all involved in the negotiation, then you can get to a treaty that actually can be implemented. Now, you know, some of this, it, these issues will deal with devolved competences. They have to be negotiated by those who are responsible for those. Again, there is no hierarchy of government. The lesson the UK government has taken from it is that you must cut out the devolved administrations because they've taken the lesson from uh, the, 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 the Belgian situation and the refusal of one of the parliaments to ratify as quickly as they wanted to, to have it ratified. So we believe there has to be an entirely different arrangement for trade. Now, we've, the trade bill has changed as it's gone through uh, parliament. It's not finished yet. Uh, but some key things haven't changed. For example, on the Trade Remedies Authority, there is to be no representation from Scotland or Wales. Common position, we've, many of these positions we're talking about today have been taken in common with, with the Welsh Government. Common position taken that there should be uh, a Welsh and Scottish representation, or at least knowledge of Welsh and Scottish circumstances, not going to happen. It's going to be entirely by merit, and clearly there isn't enough merit in Scotland and Wales to allow a place on the, on the committee. So we have to change trade deals, largely, not largely because, but also because in agriculture particularly, there will be a very strong push to diminish standards, animal welfare standards, environmental standards and other standards. And we should not allow that to happen. And at JMC level, has there been any discussion about the trade deals that, for example, have already been... Well, showcased by Liam Fox keeps telling us what, how wonderfully well he has done in all these trade deals but all that has happened so far is that a few of the existing deals with the EU have been rolled over to include uh, to, to, to apply to the UK when it leaves N not very many at all and some of course have been put off because the UK has not left uh, some have also been impossible to come to because the, the party uh, dealing with it has said, no, I want to change this, I want a bit of advantage here and a bit of advantage there. There is a, a real fear that when the UK comes to this, it will neither be equipped nor experienced enough to undertake this well. It will also seek to negotiate on behalf of, well, well ignoring the devolved administrations and responsibilities, and it will inevitably lower standards because it's desperate to have these deals. This is highly undesirable. Of course, in addition, there, no, no matter how many of these deals are, they cannot make up for the deals we already have. And that is a tragic situation. We're going into a, a set of relationships that will make us poorer and have worse trading relationships. Why anybody should volunteer for that, I don't know. The, the, I think one of the problems is that they are um, sticking to an orthodoxy that says international trade agreements are absolutely a reserved matter, um, not a devolved matter, notwithstanding the impact uh, um, that there is likely to be on devolved um, policy areas. So that part of the equation is being left out of the, the conversation because there is, a, there is a sticking to the orthodoxy of international trade agreements being um, a matter for um, Westminster and a reserved government. So a trade agreement which might have profound implications for, uh, um, for, for devolution, the devolution settlement for policies in, uh, uh, in, in the devolved administrations is is effectively being treated as if it doesn't involve the devolved administration. So it's a, it's a, it's an extraordinary yeah. position, um, and uh, uh, and 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 is a point of real um, challenge for all the devolved administrations. Now, at the moment, it's Wales and Scotland, but I would hazard a guess that should the administration in Northern Ireland be re-established, that in a number of areas they will be in exactly the same position. They cannot not be in the same position because these will be issues and challenges uh, directly for them too. Um, uh, and uh, uh, you know that is that is going to be one of the real challenges as as we move forward. And at the moment, I guess there isn't really an answer. Okay. We, we should note, of course, that whilst international relations is reserved, the implementation of interna international agreements is not reserved. Uh, so there is a role for uh, the devolved administrations in these matters, a role that was confirmed by the Supreme Court. Okay, thank you. John Scott. <laughs> thank you, uh, convener. Uh, and so um, I welcome um, the, the commitment by the Scottish and Welsh governments not to pursue policy divergence where we agree frameworks are necessary 
or while discussions are ongoing. Uh, and I think that's a very good uh, starting point. And, and perhaps um, that model, just given what you were talking about a moment ago in terms of trade negotiations, might be built on um, in terms of a voluntary, um, if not agreement to trade deals, but at least uh, an understanding of what the UK government is, is endeavouring to do. Um, however, the specific question that I want to ask is, um, what will the impact be on the Scottish Government's legislative agenda um, of that voluntary arrangement going forward from here, given how unclear the whole situation is? Um, I'm not sure I understand that. Um, in, in terms of your programmes for government and future? Only if there was a commitment yeah, only if there was a commitment to legislation in any of the frameworks would there be a commitment, would there be a legislative impact on the legislative programme. Uh, in terms of the policy position, that would, if there were changes in policy, then the mm. responsible ministers from the government would be accountable to the committees and to the parliament uh, for discussing that policy and, and, and moving it forward. Um, there isn't, there might be a secondary legislation but I think it's unlikely. I think the question is scrutiny. How would we scrutinise framework arrangements that we'd entered into that were non-legislative? And I think that the way to do that would be through, this, through the committee structures of the Parliament um, and through a protocol which we are discussing and considering with the Parliament, just as we had a protocol for secondary legislation, uh, which was required by Brexit. And, and I'm grateful to the committees who were you know, very, very cooperative in that. Just as we had a protocol for that, I think a protocol for scrutinising the frameworks. Should they, in the end, exist? We are, you know, we are talking about um, a, a situation which is hypothetical at the present moment. We're moving towards having those frameworks, but they wouldn't exist until after an implementation period. And they would exist for a limited period of time. The legislation says that. But I don't think, if, where, there are, where there is legislation that rises out of frameworks, those have actually turned out to be the hardest things to resolve. Agriculture and fisheries are examples. Where trying to get tie everything down in legislative terms is very difficult to do. Non-legislative frameworks <coughs> that let rest upon memoranda of understanding or other issues like that are easier to do. Legislative frameworks underpinned by legislation will always, in the end, have disputes. For example. As you, as you of course know, given your experience, there is a, 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 a dispute about whether or not state aids are covered uh, in terms of devolved or reserved uh, uh, competence. And that is a problem within the agriculture bill at Westminster, because both the Welsh government and the Scottish government have said that state aids are not a reserved matter. The Westminster government says they are reserved matter, but they won't answer letters explaining why that is much in the manner of somebody who doesn't want to open the electricity bill because they don't want to see what's in it. The UK government won't look at the letters we're sending them saying, tell us, explain to us how that is reserved because it doesn't appear to be anywhere in Schedule 5. And so perhaps we're turning to something which is easier and maybe uh, Cabinet Secretary Rosanna Cunningham would like to answer this question. Can you provide any further detail on common frameworks under the portfolio you have um, in terms of chemicals, waste and producer responsibility, ozone depleting substances and F gases? I know you've already mentioned them uh, and the EU emissions trading scheme. I mean, how are these being prioritised in your programme of work? And well, as I indicated earlier, um, these are still being conducted at the level of meetings with officials. These common frameworks don't exist. They are um, uh, frameworks that are being uh, 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 continually uh, discussed. Um, I'm going to ask uh, um, Don, I think, is probably most involved in the officials' discussions that are taking place. Um, it, it, the one that I will maybe say something about is the is the, um, uh, the one that impacts on the EU emissions trading scheme because that is still um, being conducted. We, we've still got quite a lot of um, minister to minister conversations. We, we are having regular um, telephone conferences now with uh, Claire Perry uh, about this. Um, um, and that is, is 
uh, does have some problematic issues. And again, I go back to the issue of accountability and, uh, uh, and, and scrutiny because on, on the basis of a no-deal Brexit, what effectively is going to happen um, is, is, a, is a carbon tax will be brought in um, allegedly on an interim basis. So we keep having to get on the record mm. that this must be only seen as an interim uh, uh, response um, to deal with a no-deal scenario um, because obviously the far better response is a proper emissions trading scheme uh, because a carbon tax is out with, I guess, even Claire Perry's purview at that point, um, moves into the Treasury um, and my abiding concern is that once they've done it, they may not want to undo it. So there's an example of you know, a situation that is still ongoing. So officials are talking, but minister, ministers are talking at the moment about that one. And I'll ask Don to come in maybe on the other three that are still under discussion between officials. Sure. Um, well, the, the waste one is the easiest one to get out of the way, and that, that is still very much at the uh, scoping stage between officials. Um, the producer responsibility schemes um, have operated at a UK level for some time. And we're still at the stage of deciding whether we actually need a legislative framework on waste and producer responsibility or whether the current arrangements that have operated for a number of years can just roll forward uh, as they have. So th the waste one is at a very kind of early kind of scoping stage. We're really trying to decide if anything has changed as a result of Brexit that would mean we, we, we need a, a legislative framework. Um, the, the, the chemicals one is a bit further on. Um, you know, there is definitely a sense of something having changed as a result of Brexit in the chemicals world uh, and the relationship between the governments having changed and there being um, quite possibly uh, a need for a legislative framework to underpin the future relationship between the governments. We've had a number of workshops, probably three or four workshops now, to start to define um, what the objectives of a framework would be, what the content of it would be. Um, we've had the first meeting of a governance group that brings the officials together in a, in a, in a, a forum to try and make decisions uh, around these things. But we have not yet reached the stage of having a draft that's ready to go to ministers for consideration. And that's, that's probably still uh, a little bit away. Um, apart from anything else, um, it's quite hard to put together a draft to go to ministers until you actually know specifically the scenario. <laughs> that you're dealing with. So that's, that's obviously one of the constraints at the moment. Thanks so much. Shall I move on yes, to the next move question? On. Um, so the next questions are uh, about secondary legislation to some extent, uh, Cabinet Secretaries. And, and what is the Scottish Government's view about the UK Government's statement that EU exit statutory instruments may provide the basis for interim or longer term framework arrangements? Uh, what, is, what is your view on the level of parliamentary scrutiny, scrutiny given to these SIs if they will provide the basis for interim or longer term framework arrangements? Um, discuss. I mean, it seems to me that it, it is likely, given the evidence we've just heard from <laughs> Pro Professor Reid, that there's nothing so permanent as a temporary measure. But and, and that is a concern I've obviously flagged up this morning already about yes. some of the temporary measures that are being the interim um, solutions that may just slide into very long interim solutions. So um, we've been um, consenting so far on uh, strictly on the basis that these are arrangements that would be needed in a no deal scenario. And that is how it's all being predicated. Um, obviously, the way the, the, the scrutiny has been uh, achieved was agreed between the two, between the, the, the Scottish Government um, and the Scottish Parliament um, and in, you know, discussions with Westminster about how we were going to manage uh, this entire process. Um, it did allow for, I mean, I know this committee's had to work quite hard, but it did allow for some detailed uh, consideration. Um, uh, I think... Um, it, it, it may be the case that the SI solutions are ones that we might think are actually appropriate for going forward, um, uh, but that's not. We don't predicate them on that basis, um, and they would have to be looked at one by one, almost as to whether or not that was an appropriate thing. Um, uh, uh, you know, there, there might be some of that whole SI program where where the where the solutions were 
pretty technical, where there wasn't really much alternative, in which case that's just where we're going to be. Um, uh, and, you know, I've already referred to a situation with emissions trading where, you know, my concern is that the interim solution might indeed become a permanent solution. <laughs> uh, and I'm very much hoping that that's not the way um, Claire Perry approaches it when it when it uh, when it appears so um, uh, you know where we've been with the SIs is where we had to be in preparation for no deal um, we now have to look again at some of those solutions and decide whether or not they're fit for longer term purpose or whether or not they really are only uh, uh, interim solutions that will need to be uh, uh, put away when we're into a much longer term scenario I don't know whether Mike's got a bigger well, this is covered by the phasing of the, um, the frameworks themselves. Um, you know, phase one was the, the starting process, took quite a while to get the, uh, both the fundamental principles right and also uh, to make sure that there was proof of concept for the programme. Phase two was detailed policy development. Phase three, which is where they are beginning to move into now, I mean, not all of them have got there, includes stakeholder engagement. Now, as Duncan referred to, phase four is when the final agreement and what it has looked like goes to ministers for approval. Now, at that stage, you know, ministers, certainly from this administration, will not be approving uh, arrangements that are ad hoc and temporary and designed only to suit one partner. So if there is a temporary and ad hoc arrangement in place as a result of SSIs that have, or SIs that have come through as a no-deal process, and, and Rosanna's entirely right about that, they will not stand if, that, if their new arrangements are put in in place phase four, otherwise there won't be an agreement. And then phase five is post-implementation arrangements after, of course, the end of an implementation period, and who knows when that will be. But, you know, we're not going to consent to long-term arrangements uh, in areas where the framework is coming into place uh, unless we are satisfied that they are suitable for our purposes. So interim arrangements will just be just that, and it's, it's in the judgment of the individual portfolio cabinet secretaries. Uh, you know, as part of government, whether or not they consent to these and how they consent to them. Uh, but certainly from the JMCEN perspective, we would expect to have an overview of those two and to make sure that they were uh, acceptable to people. Fine. Thanks very much. Uh, and my final question in this area is, can the Cabinet Secretaries provide an update on discussions with the UK government in terms of UK legislation uh, which impacts on devolved policy areas? Can briefly, I, briefly, did I say? Yeah, can I go first since I just came back off the Cardiff meeting yesterday, which this was Quite. an actual discussion. Yeah. So I can I can update you. Yeah. Um, uh, we have no timetables for the Agriculture Bill, Fisheries Bill, or the Environment Bill. There are no timetables. Um, uh, uh, so we we simply don't know what is happening there. Um, uh, the there are still. Um, uh, discussions being had about certain aspects of the fisheries bill. Um, some of the devolved reserved discussions were resolved, but we still don't know, have a timetable for it. There are still some de devolved reserved discussions going on with the agriculture bill, and there are still uh, a considerable number of those discussions going forward in the environment bill, which is probably further behind both the Agriculture and Fisheries Bill. So we really aren't any further forward with any of the three of those, and they're obviously all pretty central to what we are doing. Um, um, so in a nutshell, then, those would probably de delay your own legislative programme. Um, no, we're not taking not that view. One. We're we're taking a view that we will press ahead with the things that we consider need to be done and the timescale on which we will uh, need to do them. I mean, un undoubtedly, some of this does have an impact. I mean, some of all of this does have a bit of an impact, but uh, 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 we're not planning on 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 slowing anything up right. unless there is no alternative for us. Can no. I correct the record? I, I'm mistaking Don McGilvery for a constituent of mine called Duncan McGilvery, so my apologies <laughs> to, to both of them if either of them would be offended. Um, can I just make re-echo what Rosanna said? I don't necessarily want to go any further, but simply to say that there is um, a legislative black hole at Westminster at the present moment. There is nothing happening. Um, nothing is moving forward. Uh, but our view is that in those circumstances, we need to be as well prepared as we can be but uh, it is very uncertain as to what will take place next. I should also point out there will be no legislative consent recommended by the Scottish Government 
to any of that legislation until the Sewell issue is resolved. And we have made proposals to resolve it on several occasions, but that also disappeared into the black hole without even a photograph of it. On, on current information and current understanding, we would insist that there had to be an LCM for the Environment Bill unless there are changes made. Right, I think we should move on. Okay. Thank Stuart you. Kingston. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Convener. Uh, we've been discussing in Parliament uh, for months and months, and we are again today, uh, what happens in the case of a no-deal uh, exit. Uh, how prepared are we in the case of a no-no-deal exit? <laughs> in other words, when it's an exit that is not a no-deal exit. Well... Well, we, we, we are, um, I, don't think we've, I don't think we've over prepared for a no deal, so we remain prepared for a deal. Um, but the deal that is being presently offered by the Prime Minister is, and I've said this before, uh, virtually as bad as a no deal and requires a, a great deal of preparation for it. I mean, we do not wish this type of outcome. You know, we, we proposed at the very start that there should be an, in Scotland's place in Europe in December 2016, we proposed a solution in terms of remaining within the single market and the customs union. At that stage, I should remind members that it had not been ruled out by the Prime Minister. She then ruled it out uh, the following January, I think, in the, in the Mansion House speech. And since then, we have continued to argue for that as a rational outcome. But we're now beyond that because the chaos is indescribable and the time taken for that would be considerable. We believe very strongly now that the right approach to take is to halt this revoke and have a, 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 a referendum uh, if necessary, but certainly stop doing it. Revocation would be our best option at the present moment. Um, and you know, we will continue to argue that. But if there is you know, a departure from the EU, deeply as I would regret that, we will be ready and prepared. Ready and prepared to do what we can to, um, to mitigate the undoubted considerable damage and ready and prepared to re-enter the EU as an independent Scotland as soon as we can. Um, so, so therefore, the only uh, activity that will happen at Halloween we can be certain about is that some people will be duking for apples. Yes, it is, it is important to note the timescale. People have sort of lost track of that, given there was a sense of relief that at least there wasn't a no deal. The agreement says that if there is the passage, the uh, uh, ratification and package, passage of the withdrawal implementation bill, then the UK would leave in the first of the months following. I think most commentators would believe that a six-week period would be necessary for the implementation bill, which rules out the 1st of June, in my view, now. I think that the European elections are almost inevitably going to take place. I can't see them not taking place now, uh, unless there is a pokal, and this government, UK government could pokal it, uh, but we'll see what happens. Um, the 1st of July is quite difficult in terms of that timescale. 1st of August might be possible if they could do that, but I would have thought any government would, looking at this and thinking of people's holidays would be a bit nervous about implementing such arrangements in the middle of the English holiday period. And then we've only got September and October. So this isn't a long period of time, and there, is, there seems little prospect at the present moment of a, uh, of a ratification, whether the ratification can come about as a result of the withdrawal implementation bill going into the House of Commons, which is an unconventional method of ratification, but is talked about, is another matter. But there's been no visible progress uh, during the month of, of April. And you know, we're now about to go into May, and there's also no visible progress. So the First Minister said we're scaling down our no deal planning. Uh, what, therefore, in relation to exit, is the Scottish Government doing uh, if it's not on no deal planning, or is it now being redirecting its efforts to other uh, legislative and uh, policy development priorities? Yeah, score, the, the Resilience uh, Committee has not met uh, for the last few weeks. It's been meeting weekly before then. It is recalibrating the various options, and it is discussing with individual ministers and will discuss as a committee and with Cabinet about the next steps. Uh, Rosanna, on the detail of this portfolio, can tell you what she's doing, but that's the cross-government position. Well, yeah, and, I mean, we have continued to work in respect of no deal on the, you know, some of the key areas that I think we'd already raised at previous Cabinet um, session. Um, I mean, clearly from our perspective, chemicals, waste, water... 
and uh, the EU ETS issue were, the, were very much the four key areas that uh, impacted on us. So um, some of that work will still be germane to a deal. Some of it will still be uh, um, uh, useful and helpful. But of course, if there is a deal, um, you know, I'm not entirely sure what that deal will look like uh, or what the timescale for that deal will be, but there will be a transition period um, on the back of that deal. I mean, the, 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 if you like, the anxiety about no deal is that no deal would have meant no transition, yes. that you would have just gone off the cliff edge. With a deal, um, whatever it might or might not look like, um, we will have a transition period, which presumably will you know, give us some uh, uh, ability to adjust, make adjustments that hadn't already been made. But some of the no deal preparation is relevant to mm -hmm. the uncertainty of any deal happening as well. So it's not as if, you know, I, I think we probably uh, uh, wouldn't want to characterise everything that's been done as no deal prep has been wasted time. You it won't have been. A lot of it will be, you know, helping us in that longer period if there is a deal. But the problem is, I mean, the biggest problem with all of this is the uncertainty around it. That, you know, we have a real issue because nobody really knows what's happening. Um, and some of the some of the issues, so like, you know, the water industry had made sure it had stocks in, in terms of what it needed to, to make sure water was being purified and all the rest of it. So what is our next yeah. crunch point? You know, so everybody's having to think forward in that way. Um, uh, and that and that is just something which will permeate not just the areas of this portfolio that are impacted, but across all portfolios. Um, Cabinet Secretary, you specifically mentioned chemicals, the waste sector, and water uh, among uh, in your previous response there. In particular, when we had the Chemical Industries Association before us as a committee, they highlighted some of the particular concerns that smaller. Uh, companies have in relation to chemicals and the uncertainties that uh, surround what, what preparations they can and should uh, be making. How, uh, how is the government seeking to support small and medium-sized enterprises uh, in particular? Because it isn't simply about government being prepared, it's about uh, uh, the wider economy and from there. Well, um, th there is work being done. We've, we've uh, uh, set up a uh, prepare for Brexit website, which I think um, most of you ought to be aware of, which is hosted by Scottish Enterprise. Um, and that provides information and advice for businesses who are able to access uh, that advice, um, uh, but also access online self-assessment toolkits, which will give them a, a, a sense of where they're currently at, um, book onto learning events, apply for grants. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, we've, we've tried to put in place that level of ability to, to, to interact. Um, one of the difficulties, I think, is reaching some of the very small uh, enterprises who nevertheless may still have very much outward focusing uh, business. And, and that uh, um, will be a continuing uh, conversation that we will be trying to have with them. Reaching them can be, can be challenging. Although those who are most exposed to that outward kind of exporting, importing issue will themselves have self-identified uh, uh, in that space um, and be the ones who are most likely to be accessing the information that we're looking for, uh, that, that we're providing for them. Um, I mean, that's for uh, obviously private businesses. Um, as I indicated in the, my earlier answer, you know, we're continuing to work closely with SIPA, with SNH, with, uh, uh, in relation to waste, in relation to chemicals, all of that is still um, is still work that's ongoing. We haven't stopped doing that. Um, the you know, remo removal of the imminent cliff edge uh, from the 29th of March and then the 12th of April um, does allow for a little breathing space, but we're very conscious that there is a potential other cliff edge now on the 31st of October. So we continue to have that engagement. And finally, um, given that an awful lot of resources uh, in government have gone into uh, Brexit planning, uh, have you had sufficient uh, financial and other support uh, from elsewhere to resource this? Or is this uh, something that's likely to impact other programmes? Uh, yeah. I think you'd be surprised if I said that we had had. No, we haven't. Um, the, 
there is a, a reckoning and an accounting being done of precisely what we think we have spent. Uh, it is right across the public sector, local authorities, of course, public bodies, as Rosanna has indicated. Uh, a range of organisations have been involved. Private sector bodies have been involved too. Uh, and, of course, we will be seeking uh, to have those sums um, recompensed to us. We've operated on the principle that there should be no detriment to the public finances as a result of Brexit. Scotland did not vote for it and should, shouldn't happen, but um, that's not a principle that has yet been accepted by the UK Government, but we'll continue to argue for support. Mark Ruskell. Thanks. Can I turn to the REACH chemicals regulations, which we're going to be considering again uh, later on in this committee meeting? Now, my understanding is that the regulations have been through uh, two revisions, uh, once to extend the transitional arrangements, twice uh, to deal with some of the concerns that industry was raising about supply chain. Are, are you confident now that this statutory instrument is fit for purpose? I'm not sure I would use the word confident about anything in the Brexit um, landscape. Um, um, as best we can understand it, as far as we are aware, all outstanding issues have been addressed. So that is, the, 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 from as, as far as we can really understand it, um, uh, there were amending SIs after feedback from industry stakeholders along the uh, lines that you were talking about, um, and they were made to ensure continuity of um, the supply chain. So <clears throat> while the word confidence, I think, would be overstating it, this is an area where as best we can understand, the issues have been addressed. Now, it is also an area where, um, and Don will attest to this, I have kept asking questions because I'm conscious that there's been some concerns around the IT system that was being put in place and whether it was going to be fit for purpose, etc. cetera. Um, so I'm, I am trying to keep on top, particularly of this one, um, because it's one of those areas where I don't think people understand the extent to which it underpins so much of, you know, the economy as well. Mm -hmm. So, uh, um, but confidence, no. Um, to the best of our understanding, yes. Okay. Don, I don't know whether you want to add anything to that. Um, no. I think you've expressed it very well, <laughs> Cab Okay. Uh, I mean, there are fresh issues that keep emerging with, with the proposed regulations. I mean, one issue that emerged last week in Westminster was the potential for increased animal testing if there's a need to duplicate the testing arrangements in the UK regulations, uh, in addition to the testing that's already taken place with the European REACH system. Um, so last week, 12 MPs, cross-party group, wrote to Therese Coffey asking the UK government to absolutely rule out the requirement for increased animal testing and duplication of the test. What, what's the Scottish Government's position on this? Is this something that you're concerned about? And have you made any representation to UK ministers on this? Okay. So, uh, in truth, that's the first I've heard of that. Um, right. I'm trying to have a conversation with Don <laughs> here to establish whether or not he's uh, had any of this surface with him. It is one of the problems that we have, that often things surface almost mm -hmm. unofficially and informally. Um, uh, and while I can keep a track of everything, uh, uh, that, I, that surfaces on Twitter. Sometimes things don't appear mm -hmm. on Twitter. So, Don, mm. if you think yeah. you might know something about yeah. this. So, um, I wasn't aware of the, the uh, activity at Westminster last week, um, but I think I am aware to, of the background to the issue, which is obviously in transitioning from the EU database to the UK database, uh, the UK companies or, or the agents of overseas companies will have to provide information into that database. Now, that information is sometimes held by other people. Mm -hmm. It's commercial information. They will have to negotiate access to that information. They may have to pay for access to that information. Now, I think where the NGOs are coming from is what happens if they can't access that information? Would they have to go and retest? And would that mean more animal testing now? Um, my belief is that the supply chain will sort this out and that there will be a negotiation, that there will be access, possibly at a price, that this is largely a money issue, probably, or, or an access and a commercial issue that will need to work itself through. You know, certainly my our strong belief and objective is that it should not end up in a place where you have to have additional animal testing uh, to overcome this issue. Communicated 
those thoughts to the uh, relevant minister at Westminster? Um, certainly at Not official yet. level, they are well aware of our position on that, right. that we would be very concerned if where we ended up here was with additional unnecessary animal testing. I mean, I think given that this, is a, this has been a surprise this morning, it, it would be useful perhaps to get a bit more reflection on what actions you, you, you can take as a government but it is to raise symptomatic these concerns. Because, I, I mean, I understand that it is an issue around the confidentiality requirements around data, but, you know, surely it's the role of government to lead on this as well, uh, rather than just let the market decide. But it's symptomatic of what what is surfacing all over the place, which are, if you like, the unknown unknowns are yeah. now beginning to be known. Um, and these yeah. are the things that would have been very difficult to have anticipated um, uh, uh, um, in, in, any earlier than, than when they do surface. Yeah. And it is, that is going to happen, I suspect, more and more and more. Yeah, yeah, it's not, not a criticism, and I under, yeah, understand, it's, it's, you know, that this is just, you know, a nightmare. Um, my last question about reach was um, a little bit more fundamental, and it, and it is about the shift from a, a system that at the moment is very open, you know, uh, decision-making between the European Commission, European Parliament, um, stakeholder expert groups involving academics and industry and ENGOs and others um, working together, a very open European system. Um, to now a very much a closed system uh, with no stakeholder involvement at all. Um, so I'm wondering what, what the government's position on this. I mean, I think, you know, you, you're kind of wanting us to support the REACH amendment, but, you know, we had CEPA in last week. Um, CEPA indicated that if they were directed to, they would perhaps be able to involve stakeholders more in discussions around the development of these chemical regulations. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I see a real loss here. I see us losing something that, you know, is very much an intrinsic part of European decision-making. So how do, we, how, do we, how do we work around this? How do, we, how do we not lose that architecture of expert advice and support? Well, one of the challenges in this particular area was the almost impossibility of replicating at a Scottish level in the time that was available the, uh, the appropriate regulatory system that you would have had to have in place. Mm -hmm. um, and, and therefore, we were confronted really with this is one of those areas where we had little option but to try um, and have the conversations at the UK level. Um, and uh, um, I, uh, we are absolutely of the view that any UK chemicals regime should be based on strong science but also be transparent. Um, and, and it, you know, this will be one of the continuing uh, um, areas, I suspect, where there will be um, uh, uh, kind of a, a disjunct between how we see the way things should go forward and how they may go forward. Um, so uh, um, I, I don't think it is ideal. Um, you would hardly expect me to say nothing other than if it had been possible, I would have, I would have said we should just do our own system. But um, as far as uh, uh, we could assess it, it would have been an absolute impossibility to have done so on the basis of what was then understood to be the no-deal timetable. Um, and, and therefore, we, we are uh, where we are. Is there um, a danger this becomes a permanent way of working now? Well, we lose that expert groups and... But then we're back to the conversation what, that we had earlier. Yes, of course, there is always a danger that some of these interim uh, uh, arrangements become absolutely permanent. Um, and, uh, uh, and that is something that we have to be really, really conscious so of. So what could SEPA do? Could SEPA run a shadow expert group in Scotland involving industry, involving stakeholders? I haven't discussed it with lead. SEPA, so I'm not going to commit SEPA to anything that, you know, at, at the moment, uh, uh, I wouldn't necessarily know that they were in truth resourced um, to be able to do and or capable of doing so. And it's not a conversation I've had with SEPA. So if they raised that at the committee, um, with you, then we'll make sure we talk to SEPA about what it is they think, what space it is they think they uh, they can uh, uh, they can be in. Um, Don, I don't know if there's anything you want, you want to add. Yeah, I mean, obviously, the other question that arises here is is what stakeholder engagement structures are there going to be at the UK level within the UK system? Now, there are there are some features of the current chemicals regime at UK level that do involve stakeholders. So, for example, I'm aware there's a chemical stakeholder forum that involves stakeholders and chemicals policy at UK level. Um, or certainly there has been uh, in the past. Um, I guess the question is how how will that relate to the the kind of specific regulatory regime here? 
what was the function of these EU committees? Were they, you know, my understanding is they were advisory committees, and I think there might be a difference of opinion between UK government that saw them as a way of um, um, brokering advice across the 27 EU member states, whereas I think some of the NGOs saw them as more of a kind of way of engaging stakeholders. And I think that is where, where the crunch has come, and I think there's just a need to kind of resolve that and try and come to a common understanding of what was the function of those committees and, and, and what kind of role can and how, how best to involve stakeholders in, in, mm -hmm. in the process going forward. Mm -hmm. could, I, could I make one point? And it's, I know, you know, clearly I, I know very little of this in terms of expertise and that's to the right of me but uh, here. But I just want to make the point that it is uh, uh, the argument of, of mitigation whilst I would love to be able to mitigate every bit of damage that Brexit will cause, it is impossible. You know, Brexit is not a good idea. It will cause damage in whatever iteration it has, soft or hard, and the resources to mitigate Brexit are simply not available to us in our current state. That is simply not possible to do. The keeping pace powers that we had in the continuity bill would have allowed us to move forward and in discussion with your own party as well as the other parties, we have agreed a way in which we would like to bring those back. And I, I think the limitations on them that the continuity bill eventually had will probably dissolve a bit because we want to do more of that. But it would be the wrong assumption to make that in every detail, in every part of our national life, we could mitigate or shadow or change uh, the, what is happening with Brexit. Regrettably, we can't. To get out of Brexit, we really just uh, have to either make sure it doesn't happen or get out of the UK. There's also an issue with like reach took many years to develop, mm. and we don't have <laughs> yeah. something many exactly. years. Yeah. Okay, uh, Angus McDonald's got a quick question on that theme before we move on to Claudia. Thanks, Convener. Just staying with reach uh, uh, briefly, um, the, the committee has looked in, uh, since last week uh, at the situation regarding Switzerland and reach. Um, now, we know that Switzerland is a member of EFTA, uh, but not a member of the EEA, and it's not a member of EU REACH. Uh, it couldn't come to an agreement with the EU uh, regarding uh, the, the, the stipulations. Now, um, Switzerland did investigate being part of REACH, um, but there, there were three conditions the EU set that were not acceptable to it. Um, one, accepting the supervision of the European Court of Justice, or presumably the EFTA, um, a court which the EEA countries use, uh, adopting all REACH decisions on chemicals without a vote in the process and adopting the other EU regulations that work with REACH to protect human health uh, and the environment. So um, we can assume that the UK would be uh, presented with the same conditions if it wanted to stay in REACH and, uh, outside the EU and the EEA. So looking ahead, um, should we find ourselves in the EEA or EFTA, uh, presumably you would encourage the UK government um, to remain in REACH rather than proceed with REACH UK, which may or may not be fit for purpose. Well, yes. I mean, you know, uh, I take the same view on all of these as I've taken with the, uh, the EU ETS. We'd be far better just staying in the scheme uh, rather than having to set up some kind of ersatz version of a scheme which has been working um, working well. And I would say the same um, with REACH and, and any other uh, similar scheme. But it kind of goes back to the fundamental point that, frankly, you know, we've, we've got what's best fit for purpose and we appear to be leaving it. Um, so whatever we design isn't going to be as good as. And, and remember, these are all things that are being designed around no deal. Um, uh, so in, indeed, uh, whatever the relationship post-Brexit that we have, then we should be doing our best to come to the best deal possible that will keep us within the ambit of, of uh, uh, what is already there. But it does seem an extraordinary position that we'd be in to get ourselves out and then have to effectively negotiate, mm. Mm. in theory, back in again. Thanks. Claudia Beamish. Thank you, convener. Um, this is a question for, for both um, cabinet secretaries. Um, uh, we're, we're, we've already touched on some of the environmental governance and principles issues, but not so much on enforcement arrangements. And um, the first broad question is, um, as we know, um, uh, the Scottish Government is committed to um, maintaining environmental principles as per the continuity bill, which um, my colleague Mark Ruskell and I were, um, were involved 
in with Amendment 39, even despite the court decision. And we're, we're wondering, and um, Mark may well come in on further questions, um, if there's comment on any time frames for um, legislation and the scope of proposals um, here in Scotland. Yes, um, I wrote to the presiding officer uh, some weeks ago, I think uh, almost three or four weeks ago, um, as a result of discussions that had taken place between the parties. So this is, this is not ex cathedra from the Scottish Government. We had a discussion about how we would take the bill, the bits of the bill forward that were deemed to be possible to take forward. Uh, now, there were broadly two avenues you could follow. You could go through a reconsideration stage of a, a bill. It's never been done before in this parliament because there's never been a bill that had been challenged uh, uh, for its competence. Um, that would have been quite a narrow way forward. These, these standing orders were written in uh, 1999, essentially, for the, the, uh, 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 at the outset of the parliament. And they would only have allowed us to take the exact terms of each item and do it again, things had moved on. You know, this is a, Brexit is a, if, if nothing, it is a constantly changing scene. So what we agreed as a group um, was that we would try and bring forward those things, but we might want to add to them and build on them and develop them. So you could broadly take three sets of, of items. There are items which the, uh, one item, which the Supreme Court decided was out of scope uh, and that clearly would fall. It's a very minor item, and it, it's the same as an item that exists in the Welsh Bill. There are a range of items which were in scope in that bill, but were ruled out of scope by subsequent UK legislation. Uh, you know, in a, in a, a, one must regard that as a sleight of hand, legislative sleight of hand from the UK government, uh, and we need to look at those again and to see uh, what we can do with them and how we can rephrase or repackage them if we can. <laughs> and thirdly, there are a range of items, and those environmental governance is, is one of them, but there was also the keeping pace power and one or two other items um, which we would like to bring back either as a standalone bill, and we have committed ourselves to a standalone bill for some of those, or within other legislation, if that re legislation was the, the relevant way to do it. So presently, we are working up the ideas into what that legislation would look like. We will, of course, continue to consult with the other parties. We did that for you know, as much as we could during the, the, the continuity bill, and I do remember discussions we had about uh, Amendment 39. I'm, do admire you for remembering the number of the amendment. I'm afraid it's all just gone into out of my mind now. But uh, we will consult about that and we will see what we can bring back. Now, the detail of what we do with environmental governments will be entirely up to, to Rosanna and, and her team. But the vehicle may well be that bill. Uh, but we'll continue to develop it. Yeah, and I mean, basically, what we did was to take on the 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 you know the purpose and intent of those parts of the continuity bill. Um, and behave as if they had already been put into legislation because we're doing the consultation that was a consultation that was meant to happen within six months of the royal assent of that bill. So we've just gone on ahead and that's what we're doing. And, and that, of course, is a very current conversation uh, and will inform what would, what would potentially or what could go into the bill. So um, and I, at this stage, I can't say exactly what that would look like. And could I ask um, both or either of you, um, in terms of uh, governance again, um, the UK government has, ha has done work towards setting up the, um, the EOP in advance of knowing what the exit scenario is. Um, is, is there um, work here to set up an, an, uh, a, a complementary body or, or, or some... We're waiting to see the outcome of the consultation as to what is considered right. to be appropriate here. Right. Um, uh, the uh, uh, EOP, the, 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 the body that uh, uh, Westminster is setting up, was the um, was uh, the one that they was something they consulted upon. They, they approached their consultation in a different manner. So they decided an outcome and then consulted on it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that was the one which I think we got at about four o'clock the day before they were going to publish the consultation. Mm -hmm. And both Wales and Scotland just asked them to remove uh, the references to Wales and Scotland in that. Um, and uh, that's why it is the way it is just now. So we are not having, uh, neither Wales nor Scotland are approaching this from the point of view of having discussions about uh, participation in that body. Um, Wales, interestingly enough, has consulted in the same way that we have consulted, um, uh, rather than make a decision and then consult on, the, on, 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 on that. Uh, I, I'm not 
convinced that the AOP is going to work out just quite as well as Michael Gove may have thought. All right, thank you. And just before the questions on enforcement and and that, that side of things and, and possible court arrangements. Um, is there any comment on the concerns about uh, if we did go to, to no deal uh, or indeed the transition in terms of governance gaps? Well, uh, you know, the... the well, I mean, the, when I say it, is there any, of course there is, but <laughs> can you... Well, can you yeah, and I mean, and there, 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 will be, um, there will be some... Uh, uh, some things that we can uh, move to uh, quite quickly. The, 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 the lack of clarity, the chaos that's ongoing just now is, uh, makes it extremely difficult. Um, and we're just going to uh, work through our uh, uh, processes. Um, we, are, we are looking at what some interim measures might look like in terms of a no deal. Um, uh, uh, because there are some existing mechanisms already available, the extent to which people maybe understand them is is, is less is less certain, um, and uh, so we are having a look at some uh, uh, proportionate interim measures in the event of a no deal, um, but we're we're not designing an interim big bang because that's not how we're approaching the the the, the, the way of looking at this. A school, you had a question on this theme? Um, yeah, I was just going to move, move us on, convene a bit, to, to looking at the UK um, Environment Bill and just whether the Cabinet Secretaries could just out, outline your, your sort of top level concerns about the way that this bill is being drafted. Well, we, we don't really have it all. Um, uh, we've got, there were, there were draft clauses published in the run up to Christmas, which um, uh, was to allow the consultation about the EOP, mm -hmm. um, but there are other uh, uh, um, additional things in the bill, uh, most of which we don't regard as, as, as impacting on us. There are, however, some references to reserved matters, although they're not really defined, um, and we are, that is one of the struggles that we're having with them. Right. Um, uh, and and I, I think I said earlier that if, if they continue to not uh, move on this, then an LCM would be required for us. But it, it wouldn't really be on the specific things, because I think from uh, my understanding is the intention with that bill is to, to formally legislate for the, for the EOP, but also to do some other things that might be getting ladled into it. Uh, deposit return is one thing. I'm, I'm looking at Katrina just to see that uh, uh, if I'm right. But, but because it's not actually about devolved policy making, mm -hmm. yeah. other than the references which have given us some concern, but they're not about specific policies, if I'm right. So, so the UK government will be creating a wider environment bill. So far, the only aspects of that that have been published are the provisions in relation to environmental principles and governance. Yeah. So. We hear about things that might go into it, mm -hmm. but we don't yeah. know what they might be. Um, and, and as I said, some of the drafting is already giving us a little bit cause for concern on that devolved reserved issue. Mm -hmm. um, but it's it's so we're not really getting much traction yeah. yet. But to be to be honest, I, I think the work on it has just stalled completely. I, I don't think there's really kind of much. And and yesterday. There was no real sense that I got that we could expect an environment bill in Westminster anytime soon. Right. Okay. Do, uh, I, officials, of course, have these conversations with uh, their counterparts uh, uh, very often, so sometimes they do know a little bit more than we do. There are ongoing discussions at official level about some of the wider aspects of the bill, mm -hmm. um, which we understand will encompass areas around um, producer responsibility, some measures around water quality potentially um, and we are currently working to establish the full scope of the bill as the UK government understands it. And obviously we're going to have Michael Gove in front of the committee in a week or two's time. I was going to ask just briefly then just about executively devolved functions in relation to, I mean I'm thinking here perhaps in relation to the offshore wind industry which is you know hugely important um, for decarbonising and promoting a Green New Deal. But I mean, could it, could it be the OEP might step in if there was an offshore wind farm and say, hang on a minute, this is our remit. We've had a complaint. We're investigating this. I, I mean, need to I ask Michael Gove. 
Right. Okay. Well, I'm we'll, sorry, we'll but I, don't, I mean, genuine, we'll genuinely, I, I, I don't know the answer to that. Yeah, I, and, just... and, and it's one of the things that we will be trying to establish. And one of the reasons we're being very wary about the, the way it's drafted just now, just to, for us to understand exactly what they think is, because we, you know, I think that one of the bits of phraseology in the briefing that I've got, and I don't have it in front of me, is, is that we have yet to establish, to establish areas of reserved environmental policy. And right. yet they are trying to insist that there might be some areas of reserved environmental policy, but, but we can't, and they won't establish in concrete terms mm. what it is they've got in their minds. Yeah. Okay, very but, short question from Claudia Bimesh. Uh, thank you, Kavina. Um, in relation to enforcement arrangements, um, uh, I'll, I'll, I will be brief, but is there any comment that either of you can make about um, any intention to legislate or bring forward an independent watchdog with powers parallel to those of the EU in Scotland? Or could you just update us uh, as to um, that complex issue? Or, or I'm sorry, I'm not entirely clear what, what you mean. In, in terms of... So uh, the answer to that probably an independent is no. Watch, in, ter <laughs> in terms of an independent watchdog, uh, uh, would you be... For environmental policy? Yes, for environmental right. policy. Sorry, that's what... Right, OK. No, about. sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm being too brief, sorry. <laughs> um, uh, is there... Uh, could you share any thinking with us about how that's progressing? Because we've taken a lot of evidence in relation to whether it should be... Well, there's an ongoing consultation, and that would yeah. emerge during consultation, uh, uh, during the consultation. So at this point, we're not preparing for any such thing. Uh, um, uh, you mean something equivalent to the EOP? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, well... No, the, the European Court of oh, the Europe Justice. Well, but the... EOP is meant to replace the European Court of Justice. Yes, but I'm asking if there's England. an interest in something which is Scotland um, specific. Well, if there's any thoughts on that at all. Well, at the, the consultation is, is where okay. the discussion around that should take place. Fine. Angus MacDonald. Uh, thanks, Kevin. I'm conscious that time's uh, uh, wearing on. Um, uh, so if I could turn to EU funding and support structures. Uh, last week we had some discussion regarding Horizon 2020 and the, the forthcoming Horizon Europe. Um, so, um, and to help with the context, the, the committee on its visit to Brussels uh, some time ago now uh, met with the Norwegian directorate or delegation uh, and we learned that Norway has been particularly successful in tapping into Horizon 2020. So, um, can you update the committee on what the Scottish Government is doing to clarify the situation regarding potential loss of EU sources of funding? Uh, what are the current funding guarantees and what's the government prioritising in terms of securing post-EU exit funding? Well, uh, you know, um, what we're trying to do is try to keep raising it, and it was one of the items on the agenda for the meeting yesterday, so it is an active conversation that we continue to press the UK government to commit to, to actually fulfil the commitment it made, uh, uh, which was in absolutely direct and, you know, unambiguous terms, that it would replace all of the EU funding. Um, and as yet, we have got absolutely no uh, um, certainty around that. Now, you know, if, if, uh, if I was to be fair to uh, my colleagues in DEFRA, they probably are looking for the exact same uh, solution. The difficulty is this is all being driven by the Treasury. Um, and uh, uh, I think that uh, um, there may be some frustrations even at the... Uh, level of the various departments in Westminster because I'm pretty sure they want an answer to this too. So we have absolutely no clarification, but we do continue to raise it. And as I said, it was actually part of yesterday's agenda um, and therefore I am able to update you with, um, I'm sorry, but there is no movement on this other than that we continue to raise it. Um, but to raise it with ministers um, who themselves, I think, would like some clarity because they're, you know, they're having to deal with those same issues um, with England, um, uh, within England, um, and uh, um, I dare say they've got stakeholders who are uh, every bit as unhappy as ours and the Welsh are as well. I will be meeting this afternoon with a, a, a body in Scotland, which will undoubtedly raise with me, as everybody does, the issue of replacement funds, mm -hmm. and you can approach this in three ways, uh, Mr. McDonald. I want to approach it in three ways with you. The first of which is to say that um, 
you know, there are some funds like Horizon 2020 and Erasmus Plus, where we know the UK government has done a value for money exercise in their own terms, not in anybody else's terms, and come to some conclusions. Those conclusions are not finalised yet, but for example, we understand that Horizon 2020 continued membership is like the policy uh, choice of the UK, and they will have to pay into it, whereas in Erasmus Plus, they don't think it provides value for money. We entirely reject that, but this is where they are, and we can hope that that will change. The second one is that there is a shadow structure of funding. You, know, you have the Shared Prosperity Fund, which has been allegedly established. There is no information about how it will operate. Uh, there is meant to be a consultation from James Brokenshire's department about how it operates. It hasn't started yet. Uh, you, know, you can find bits of information if you say that used to be funded by or will be funded by the regional fund. So if that's being folded into the Shared Prosperity Fund, presumably it will be part of it. But you have no knowledge of whether that will be the case. And the third way to answer this is, is I have to say, pretty much in the, the manner that I was responding to, to Mark Ruskell earlier on. You, know, you can't manage or administer your way out of this complete burach. It is impossible to do so. You know, the, the, um, the question from, from uh, Claudia Beamish about, about establishing an environmental watchdog, you can't just replicate the good things that come out of the European system, the things that have made huge progress, and say, we'll just put that in. First of all, it wouldn't work, and secondly, you don't have the money to do it, and we have no idea what the money will look like. We can't do that with a funding issue, regrettably. I mean, I, I have a very long time ago, a decade ago, I was the environment minister. I was involved in setting up and administering the SRDP system. And we moved at one stage from one system to another system. We knew we were moving. We knew that this would, would happen. It still took about six to nine months. I know Mr. Scott remembers this because he was asking questions about it. it, it you know, six to nine months before the money started to flow after it stopped flowing in the, in the original scheme. This is of a much, much larger scale, and we have no idea because it is hard to exaggerate the complete implosion of the UK government on these matters, on the whole matter of Brexit. There is, to all intents and purposes, no functioning government in Whitehall. There is a government that is focused entirely upon Brexit and the chaos of Brexit. So these questions, which are not only legitimate for this committee, are essential for every third sector body, for all in, uh, bodies in the environmental sector, for every business, for the whole of society, there are no answers to. And, you know, it is distinctly possible that the UK could leave the EU, you know, any time soon. It's an act of gross irresponsibility, which is having huge damage. And I wish we could mitigate it in the way that's being suggested, but it can't be done. So with regard to the Shared uh, Prosperity Fund, is it fair to say then that the Scottish Government's had um, no opportunity uh, to input into deve the development of the proposal? No, we are right. as, None. As, uh, I mean, as far as... as, as as far as we can assess, I would have to say it is a phrase. Okay. And there is, really is nothing else at the moment behind it. It appeared in a Conservative Party manifesto in 2017. Um, there is apparently a consultation. Uh, there are bits and pieces on websites. But what it's going to be, where it's going to operate, how it's going to operate. The, the, the spin on it, constant spin on it, is that this will be administered from London. It will be a central fund. The secondary spin is that this will give power to the Secretary of State for Scotland and to the Welsh Secretary of State for Wales, and it will be administered through them in a sort of one in the eye for the devolved administrations. That's the level of consultation on something that's as absolutely vital as that. Okay, um, moving on, what uh, analysis has the Scottish Government undertaken of the importance of participation in the various EU level bodies that support environmental policy? and implementation such as the European Environment Agency? Well, um, we haven't really uh, done an analysis because right from the outset, in our view, we need to stay with them. We need to stay uh, involved. Um, I, uh, it was another issue that was raised yesterday directly uh, at the DEFRA DA meeting uh, and supported by um, my Welsh counterpart, Leslie Griffiths. Uh, you know, from my perspective, I, I consider continued uh, participation um, in the European Environment Agency as absolutely vital uh, for, for, uh, for Scotland. Of course, that's an organisation that is set up for um, uh, uh, um, participation of the state. Um, so there would be a question whether or not a, um, a devolved uh, 
uh, um, administration would be able to separately have any relationship, but we are urging, and I ur yesterday urged uh, the UK government to, uh, uh, to consider uh, effectively signing on. There is, a, there is a, I'm not quite sure what the phraseology is, there is a, there is a capacity to, to sign up as a, as a third party state um, to the uh, European Environment Agency and in my view um, it is an absolute given that the, e, that the UK should do it uh, and I did actually raise questions with officials about whether or not there was any possibility that Scotland as a devolved administration could do it even if the UK didn't so I'm not I'm not certain about that but I am strongly of the view particularly if we are to um, keep up with uh, um, uh, developments at the EU level I mean one of the issues is how do you make sure that you're networked into uh, all of that um, as it as it begins to develop um, uh, uh, you know it's the it's the you know committing yourself to keeping up with what happens in the EU it is one thing, although it becomes difficult if you find out about it, uh, you know, via a press release when something is being, uh, has already been decided, when you know that there's probably been a number of years of careful consideration given to that before it gets to that point. So we need to be involved in as many of these organisations as we possibly can be to ensure that we continue to be part of those conversations. I, you know, I, and I press the UK government, as I have done on the EU ETS, that the most sensible thing to do is to stay in. Okay. As we are rapidly running out of time, you have one final question. I do, yes. Um, last week we heard uh, how important EU funding from structural funds, but also from the European Investment Bank, is for uh, the circular economy. Um, so how can the Scottish Government ensure that investment in the circular economy is maintained? Uh, and also, um, are you considering how it could be prioritised in the new Scottish National Investment Bank? For example. I can't make you know these sorts of financial commitments. Um, uh, I, I can say to you that the the, the new bank um, is intended to take a mission-based approach to investment. Um, so there will be a strategic you know there's a, a strategic direction uh, and a set of medium-term outcomes which are ministerially driven. Um, and I know that officials are already engaging. Uh, with the um, with the bank about the potential for investment in innovation and infrastructure around the circular economy um, uh, as being uh, an absolutely vital part of uh, Scotland's economic development, um, and the first minister has has indicated publicly. Um, that a key mission for the new bank will be to support the transition to a carbon neutral society, which one would presume has to have beneath that the whole circular economy idea. So, you know, but I, you'll appreciate that I'm not the minister who is going to be taking forward the investment bank. Um, and uh, for, for exquisite detail, um, you're probably best asking. Derek Mackay? Mm. Okay, thank thank you. you very much. We have run out of time. We've gone over time, in fact. I want to thank everyone for their evidence this morning. Thank you. And we'll suspend very briefly. <laughs>
Okay, the fourth item on the agenda is to consider a proposal by the Scottish Government to consent to the UK Government legislating using the powers under the Act in relation to the following UK statutory instrument proposals. They are the Environment Legislative Functions from Directives EU Exit Regulations 2019 and the REACH uh, Amendment EU Exit No. 2 Regulations 2019. Are there any comments in relation to either of these instruments from members? Uh, Claudia? Thank you, Kavina. Just in relation to the EU uh, regulations, one that you've highlighted, I think uh, I, I have gained some comfort, if I understand it rightly, from uh, the fact that there are obligations on the um, UK government um, uh, to come to Scottish ministers um, in relation uh, specifically, uh, but as an example, to the um, marine environment, uh, where there are inshore water issues and also where there are any issues that affect us as a devolved administration. So I think I, I find some comfort from that approach. OK. Uh, Mark? Um, thanks, Kavina. Um, I, I think the, the evidence session we just had with the current secretaries was, was useful, but um, it doesn't reassure me in relation to the, to the REACH regulations that are being proposed. I mean, these regulations effectively dismantle that whole architecture of European uh, policy making, uh, it removes the role of stakeholders, uh, those civic movements that are protecting the environment, uh, industry, academics, um, experts in formulating policy. And, you know, I think that's a, a huge loss. And I, what I didn't hear at this stage uh, from the Cabinet Secretary was a commitment to try and replicate that in some way. Um, you're never going to be able to completely replicate it, but I think after the evidence we had from SEPA last week, there is a, an appetite on behalf of SEPA to engage with experts and at least, the very least, to feed that in to the process that will now be governed um, by the HSE. So I, I'm concerned about um, the, the, the status of this REACH amendment that's coming forward. I mean, it's been revised twice already. Um, you know, it's not um, competent in my view. There are new issues that are coming up the whole time, including the issue of animal testing, which was raised today and again seemed to be a, an area which the government uh, is, has been unaware of. And, and I understand the reasons why, because this is a situation that continues to unfold with unintended consequences from week to week. Uh, but right now, I, I wouldn't want to be committing any support to this uh, this amendment. I don't think it's fit for purpose. Sorry, this regulation, I don't think it's fit for purpose. Okay. Are there any other comments on this, Stuart? Uh, well, given that it's been laid by the UK government, our position is almost irrelevant. Um, but, but more fundamentally, I think, I'd, I just would wish to note, and there's no more can be done, um, that uh, sending it on the 28th of March for implementation of the twin, on the 29th or for that matter the 12th of April is simply an unacceptable way to proceed. Okay. Any other points on this? I think we're, we're all agreed that um, the lack of scrutiny time for these things has been a real problem throughout this entire process as we've been preparing for a no deal uh, no more so than, than this particular one. It looks, if I'm right, that we'll have to go to a vote on this. So, um, if I could have... Do you want to ask a question about the environment? Yeah, well, we'll take the environment um, SI first then. So, um, taking the environment legislative functions from directives EU exit regulations, um, the committee, does the committee agree to the Scottish Government's consent that the UK Government legislate on that notification? Agreed. Agreed. And taking the REACH Amendment EU Exit Regulations 2019, are um, the committee in agreement with the Scottish Government's consent the UK Government legislate on these notifications? Agreed. No. no. So we're going to go to a vote. So those f uh, in agreement, with this, yeah, given the Scottish Government consent, the UK Government legislate on this notification. Raise your hands. Okay. And those who disagree, are you abstaining? Are you? What do you do? I know. Sorry, can I? I'm, I'm not entirely sure. 
Yeah, so those that with an agreement, raise your hands again. One, two, three. And Marx dis disagrees with it, and Angus is abstaining. Gillian. I'm not sure what I'm doing, <laughs> to be honest. Um, I, 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 I share concerns, um, so I'm, I'm, I'm actually going to abstain. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so the result of that, it has passed three votes. Okay, that concludes the committee's business in public today. It's next meeting on the 7th of May. The committee will be taking evidence on tax and fiscal measures to inform its work in relation to the Scottish Government's budget. We'll now move into private session and ask that the public gallery be cleared as the public part of this meeting is now closed. <laughs>